it starts with that one little thing that we try to tell ourselves is not a big deal. But if it's really important to us, it is a big deal. It doesn't matter how simple it seems to other individuals. If it's not going to allow us to show up to this relationship 100%, we have a serious problem. Stefan in the house. <laughs> Once again. <laughs> oh, I love having you here. Our honest, no BS discussions are really, really important and I think very meaningful to so many people. And today I want to start with one of the most powerful quotes I've ever heard you say. You will never be good enough for the wrong person. Yeah. You will never be good enough for the wrong person. So how do we know when we're in a relationship whether they are the right person or whether we should basically walk away. So think about the quote, you'll never be good enough. So the way you'll expose them is by being your best that you can possibly be. And if it's still not good enough to make this, thing, make this relationship work, create harmony for both of you to be happy, then we know this isn't a match. So even look at it from the standpoint of, all right, let's say they require certain things. They require a certain level of communication from you, require a certain level of sex from you, all these things. And you know that having to do all of that seems like too much. Okay, that's already your sign this isn't going to work. Or let's say you try it and trying it feels like a burden. It feels like this is too much to have to sustain this. So you're not going to be able to keep this going over a long period of time. Again, that has exposed you two are not best for each other. I feel that a lot of people are making it harder for themselves to see what's in front of them because they're not coming with their best self. What do you mean by that then? Meaning they're holding back. A lot of people have walls up. They're guarded coming into relationships. They haven't healed from past traumas. And so by holding back, you're essentially giving your partner a free pass to do the same. All right. You're essentially validating dysfunction with your own dysfunction. Now, people may not see holding back as dysfunction because to them, it's a defense mechanism. It's how we protect ourselves. But I always say the same walls you have up to protect you are the same walls blocking your blessings. Because in a relationship, love cannot flow in and out with a wall up. It's restricting your ability to receive and give it. So you don't get to see the full potential of this relationship. You don't drive out darkness with more darkness. So you're not going to drive out their insecurities by you holding back. You're not going to drive out where you two are not in alignment by holding back. No, by you showing up as your best self, you will get to see. And not only will you get to see if the problem is them, you'll get to see if you're lacking in certain areas. So, for example, let's say to you, your best self is you have a tendency to get snarky when you when you have a discussion with people your attitude is a little you know negative and you've been conditioned to thinking well that's normal we all do that or maybe you grew up in a family that did that so now by being your best and that person still saying but no this is an issue now you have to determine okay is this an issue that i can embrace correcting and that means i have some things to work on or can i honestly say Across the board, people view this as a, as a no problem situation or no problem uh, characteristic that I have. Now I can say, no, the problem is you. You see? So if it is, I communicate well, but you still won't open up. There's nothing left mm. to do here. You see? But if I'm not communicating properly, how do I get to really hold them to the standard of healthy communication? So how, oh my God, that's so good. So how do you know in those moments... Who is who? Like, is it the fact that you're not good enough at communicating or the fact that they're resistant to communicating? Because I've heard you also say, like, if you ask your friend, I'd be like, I don't understand why he's doing that. And they're like, oh, girl, you're doing a great <laughs> job. It's him. But you're, you're now asking people who see things like you. So in those moments, how can you be truthful in knowing if it is something that is a them thing or a you thing? Yeah. So part of it, honestly, is just getting educated on what healthy relationships are really supposed to be about. And, and not just look at it as healthy relationships in a romantic sense, healthy relationships with other people. Mm. Because healthy communication is what you need to have with anyone you talk to. You should learn how to express yourself and how to listen, whether it's a child, a friend, a coworker, if you want to see successful outcomes in these situations. So once we start to understand that this is about how we interact with other human beings, 
okay? And start from that foundation because again, if it's not healthy with them, if it's truly an issue that needs to be fixed, then more, more people will see it as a problem. Mm. Now you mentioned, and you're right, if you ask people who operate like you do, they will validate your behavior even if it's negative. So you've got to be willing to go outside of that circle sometimes. Or someone that you can honestly say has successful communication with people. This seems to be someone that everyone feels comfortable talking to, enjoys talking to, I enjoy talking to them. All right, this is a person I should be asking. But don't ask the person who also has a problem communicating with other individuals mm -hmm. that other people are also shying away from opening up to. Clearly, they don't have that answer. You see, because they're not, or at least they're not, they're not implementing that answer at the very least. So I think it's recognizing other individuals who are successful in that area, but g gaining a general education of how we have, how we successfully coexist with other people in various uh, aspects and different relationship dynamics. God, that's amazing. But then you also have to really want to hear the truth and see yes. the truth because I get it. I totally, I've been that person that defends myself because I have low self-esteem. Mm. And so in those moments where maybe you've got conflict or maybe you're trying to work on this relationship, it is, it's somewhat a protective mechanism to say it's them and not me. So I think you have to really want to hear the truth so that you can see if it's them or you, because if it is you, I now with a growth mindset, think of that as being a beautiful thing because now I can improve myself. Yes. And I think also consider this. So let's say you're in a relationship, your partner says, I have an issue with your communication style. And initially you're like, well, no, there's nothing wrong with it. Everyone else thinks it's fine. But Listen to what they're suggesting. So first ask them, okay, well, what would you prefer or how would you prefer I communicate? What do you want to see? Now, if what they're suggesting is doable for you, even if you think you're fine with communication, how does it hurt you to adapt or to embrace what they're saying? Mm. Now, if while you're trying it, you're not feeling uncomfortable in the sense that you can't do this or mm. this is wrong or this is going against who you are, then why not continue to do it? Mm. Because clearly, it's at least a better form of communication for them. It's going to help the relationship get better. So there is a question also of how badly do I want to make things work with this individual? Mm -hmm. And it's always about if what they're asking me is causing me to cross a line that's against my values or makes me uncomfortable. So to use an example, let's say sexually real quick. Let's just say they're into something super kinky, all right? And that's what they want you to do more in the bedroom. But doing that goes against your personal beliefs, it disgusts you, it makes you uncomfortable. Okay, that's not something that we can then do. Mm. That's how you know, okay, we're just not a good fit then because the things that you need, I can't supply that. And if I try to, it will go against what, where, who I truly am and what's important to me. But what about when it's like, well, it's not that bad. Well, it's not that bad. Sure, just, right? And then you keep telling yourself, it's not that bad. Yeah, I'll do that for them. Yeah, no. And then before you know it, you keep moving that line. Because to the point of the sexual thing, sometimes it can be that. Like, oh, you have sex in a missionary position and then all of a sudden they want something crazy. <laughs> That's like, that can be so shocking that that can be an easy no. But what about the ones where it's just a bit and as a person that you really want to give to the person, you're like, maybe this is going to make our relationship better. It doesn't cross my morals. It doesn't actually cross that, you know, value system. But that becomes the trickling effect that in two or three years, you look back and you're like, how the hell did I end up changing who I was, thinking I wasn't good enough, all because I thought that this would make our relationship better or that it would make us bond. And now I look back and I don't even recognize who I am. So uh, again, you, you have to be honest with yourself about how are those concessions making you feel? Mm. So using again sex, if let's just say the initial request is a different position, all right? And to you, it's a little like, okay, it's not that bad, I'll, I'll try it. Now, if you're enjoying it after try it, mm. well, then it's a new art, you know, a new tool in your toolkit that you can use for future, right? <laughs> but if, it, if, if, mm. if while doing it, you're feeling some kind of way, you're feeling, uh, you know, I don't know, used, you're feeling devalued maybe, you know, whatever the case may be, then that means you made a concession that is now at conflict with who you are. So to not continue down that path would be wrong and to continue doing it would be wrong. See, there's a lot of people who they do things for their partner that their partner wants, but they're not happy doing mm. it. Now, I'm a personal believer that 
if you're not going to be happy doing it, I don't want you doing it at all. Because then the energy behind it's going to be very different, especially when we talk about sex. Like, I want you to be into it. So if you're not going to be into it, let's just forget about it, mm-hmm. all right? But I do think we have to also get to a point of understanding, whether it be sex or other things in the relationship, if what I'm requiring of you does not sit well with you, if you want to try it, cool. I think it's good to try it if it doesn't cross too far of a line for you. But if after trying it, you still feel like this is not for me, this isn't it. All right, then we just have to accept we're on two different pages and maybe we're not for each other and that's okay. Yeah, that's, that's really, it's lovely and clear, but I think there's so many things that also get in the way with that, okay. right? Because it's like, you've spoken about like when you invest your time, there's so much where it's like, well, I've tried, we've been together for a year, we may as well try more. So these are things that I think that we can also start to ignore and not necessarily realize, hey, these were actually moments where maybe you should have really addressed it or walked away, but you don't, you kind of brush it off. Maybe mm-hmm. it's just something small. And then before you know, now you've invested your time and your energy, and your family are invested now, your friends are all invested, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone gets invested in this relationship. And now it becomes even harder to really assess whether that you're right, they're right for you. So I agree. And, and that's the reason why I want people to understand we've got to get to the mindset of understanding who we are first and then who we align with, mm-hmm. who we truly fit with. Because yes, it can get tricky now with family, kids may be involved, all these different factors. But my concern is this, and this is what I've seen in, in my years of coaching couples. It's, it starts with that small thing, all right? So I had one situation where there was a couple, she loved going out dancing. While they were dating, they would go dancing every week. They get married, I wanna say a month into it, no more dancing, mm. all right? Now to a lot of people, it'd be, that's not a big deal you know, just stay. It's okay. My concern is this. Now, first I would tell her, address it with him. Let him know how it's making you feel and that you need this as part of the relationship because that's important to you. And if he loves you, I believe he will make the correction. But let's just go with what typically happens. Either she doesn't say anything or she says it, but he has excuses. And despite all his excuses, she continues to be with him. But it doesn't change the fact that she's unhappy that she's not going out dancing anymore. So now, because she's unhappy in that area, she starts to have a little bit of resentment towards him. Now, with that resentment, she can no longer be sexually receptive to him as much as he wants her to be. She might even be uh, lost attraction to him in certain ways because he's not pouring into her in that way anymore. Well, that lack of intimacy or that holding back on intimacy, whether intentional or just not no longer being as invested in it or wanting to be a part of it as much, Well, now he has an attitude with her Mm. because he's not getting the sex, all right? So now in that attitude, he starts doing other stuff to piss her off. Do you see what's happening Mm -hmm. here? It starts with that one little thing that we try to tell ourselves is not a big deal. But if it's really important to us, it is a big deal. It doesn't matter how simple it seems to other individuals. If it's not going to allow us to show up to this relationship 100%, we have a serious problem. So if you can say that not doing this or having to do this is not going to put me in a position where I cannot be who I need to be 100% otherwise and be happy and pour into my partner, cool. But if it's going to have that negative impact on you, you can't overlook it. You can't ignore it. It could be as simple, and I use the word simple, but it really is a real issue, the lifestyle two people want to live. I've seen couples where, for example, the woman is what some would consider bougie. All right. She loves a more uh, fine living, luxurious lifestyle. Okay, but the guy, the husband, he's the type where if he sees a dirty couch on the corner, he's like, oh, new couch. (laughs) (laughs) Dust it off. We're ready to go. Right. (laughs) So to a lot of people, they might say to the woman, oh, he's a good man. You shouldn't worry about it. That's not a reason to divorce. Not a reason. Well, one, if we would have took time to recognize these differences early on and accept them for what they were, we wouldn't even be this far in this relationship. So the key is learning how to cut these things off as soon as possible. But let's just say we already went that far. We're married. The fact remains that she now has resentment because this man wants to live a lifestyle contrary to where Mm -hmm. she finds her happiness, all right? It's not for anyone else to say, well, you shouldn't want luxurious. No, that's who Mm -hmm. she is. Some people like those things. Mm -hmm. Some people don't care for those things. 
But when you try to put them together, you're asking for problems. And again, it starts with, well, he wants to bring this dirty old couch into my home when I want him to go buy a new couch. And we got the money for a new couch, but he's too cheap. So no, he wants this dirty couch instead. All right, now I have an attitude. While I have an attitude with him, I'm not going to be sleeping with him the same. Mm. Now he has an attitude because you're not showing the same love anymore. Mm. And it, it just keeps going from there. And then when they come to me, they're arguing about what just recently happened, <laughs> right? That blew everything up. But they're ignoring all the root issue that was happening before then. That started with, you two want to live a different lifestyle. And you two are out of alignment with each other. You can't, you really, it's, it's extremely difficult to fix that unless you guys just find a way where she, like, it's almost like you'd have to, she would have to have her own money where she can buy what she wants and he'd have to be okay with whatever she buys mm -hmm. and then he can live cheap. But even then, living in the home together, they're gonna still clash. My God, as you were talking, so my husband Tom, when I met him, I walk into his apartment and he's like, oh yeah, I found this couch. So it's so funny that you're saying this. So here I am, bougie, right? What car are you driving? Oh my God, he didn't even change, you know, clothes or whatever. I go to his apartment. His couch, literally, he found on the street. So completely different. But what's interesting, as you were talking, it's going back to something you said earlier, is how do you feel? Because when I met, when I saw, like, he's like, oh my God, isn't this, like, look at this couch. He was so proud of himself. He was like, yeah, I found this couch on the street. Isn't this amazing? And I'm like, oh God, oh God. But what was amazing in that moment was he kind of enlightened me a little. I was like, look how happy he seems with just mm -hmm. a crappy couch. Like it almost, I was impressed by it. And I was like, that's such a lovely, lighthearted way of seeing things. Mm -hmm. And here I am thinking, about, oh my God, the couch. I was like, it's actually better to be like him. So it, it was interesting that even though we came from different worlds, like what you were saying, I think it then goes to how do you feel when this happens? Exactly. Because I wasn't like being snooty. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Yes. You know, um, I was actually embracing it. Now I will say, uh, he goes to work one day, so we're dating, we're maybe mm. a month in. I clean the couch. <laughs> I spent like five hours, it was a white couch, so you can imagine it was filthy. So I mm. clean the whole, I'm scrubbing it. Now I'm doing it because in my head I'm like, if you have to sit on a couch that's down on the street, at least wash it. So I'm cleaning it. He comes back from work and he's like, this is the best woman ever. She cares about me enough to clean the couch. <laughs> so he doesn't realize I'm doing it for my sake. Uh, now, of course, we, we talk about the story after and we're like, oh, we did it for completely <laughs> different reasons. But going back to the point that I wanted to make is that even if there is someone that is different from you and you think differently, going back to how does that make you feel is the important aspect because I didn't, I wasn't, um, I didn't frown upon him, the fact that he was different. It exactly. actually intrigued me more. Yes, and that's the thing, because imagine had you been disgusted and right. continued to be disgusted. Mm. Now your ability to even view him in a certain light is completely uh, hindered at that point mm. and derails everything. And, and this is why, again, I'm such a believer in connection, because I believe when there is connection, differences can actually complement each other and find joy in each other. Whereas when there's not a connection and there's those differences, it will conflict. Mm. It cannot come together. And that's, to me, I think that story just gives more proof to you guys having a mm -hmm. connection more than anything. But yes, as you mentioned, you did not feel some kind of way. So if we are trying something different, if we're trying what we're not accustomed to, but they need from us, and then we find like, oh, this isn't so bad. Oh, okay, I can do this. Mm. Then that's great. But if you're doing it and the whole time you're wishing, like, I wish I didn't have to do this. This sucks. I hate this. That's a problem. Mm. You know? I don't think we ask ourselves enough questions to understand ourselves. Yes. We kind of like, and I'm speaking for myself here, like I used to just go into perpetual motion and be like, oh, I guess that is, that is, that is. And I would never question things. Um, and I love, I've heard you speak about actually when someone's in a situation where they're not sure if this relationship is actually working, like, do I stay? Do I go? You know, um, am I good enough? Are they the right one for me? Like all these things that we say, I've heard you actually say one simple question. It's like, why are you staying? Mm -hmm. So talk to me about asking ourselves that question, how that can impact us, and then what other things we can do to really decipher whether if this is a relationship that we should really put our time and energy because there is a future or if it's actually time to just walk away? Yeah, so definitely we have to ask ourselves that question because, as you said, a lot of times we're running from the reality of our situation because we don't want to face certain questions. We don't want to deal with what's going on deeper within, within us. 
And many, whether it be a woman's intuition, hearing your spirit, God, or even just other people giving you insight and telling you this isn't it, but you don't want to have to accept that. Mm -hmm. So you keep trying to look past that Mm -hmm. and focus your energy on whatever you're trying to accomplish or that one good thing you can use to validate being here. Okay. So what comes to mind as an example of that, there's two things that I have found women use as a shield to defend staying where they don't belong. It's I love him and the sex is great. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things. Reason being is because when, when they say, but I love him, they know that people will try to work with trying to rationalize why you should give it a chance. So basically, if I come to you and I say, this has been a problem and all the boom, 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 but I hit you with, but I love him so much. There's a part of you that wants to find like, okay, let me see if I can give her some hope here. Let me see if I can give her a reason why it's okay to try this. Or I will feel less willing to push back against your desire to stay. So it's this great defense mechanism. And I say great, not because it actually should be used, but it's effective. Powerful, yeah. Yes. And so a lot of women, whether consciously or subconsciously, understand that. The other one is the sex is great. Because if you ever notice, people can have a discussion and they can talk about all the bad things going on. And the minute they say, but the sex is amazing. The other person said, oh, I, I get it. Because <laughs> like, you oh, kind of do. <laughs> yeah, now, now I understand. Go ahead. Continue as you are. <laughs> right? And, and what's crazy is, it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out this number. In 90% of the cases, it's not great. Mm. They're just saying it because, mm. again, they know by saying it, you'll fall back. You won't push them to face the reality of you don't belong here. Mm. This is not for you. So going back to asking yourself, why am I here? Yes, because that why could be fear of being alone. That why could be fear of starting all over. That why could be my time clock is ticking and I, I'm getting older and I want to have kids and I want to have marriage. That time cl- that that why could be I told myself I would be married and have kids by this age and I refuse to deviate from that plan. And if I've already deviated somewhat, I don't want it to go too much further. That why could be friends and family putting pressure. When are you going to have a baby? When are you going to have a man? What's going on? What's wrong with you? That that pressure builds up to where women will settle for a man. And men do the same thing. Settle for someone just to appease family and friends. The why, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it, it, it could be happening. But once we understand and accept the why... If the why is anything other than... One of the biggest fallacies is that relationships shouldn't be work. Say what? We put time, effort and hard work into growing our careers or our business, but love should just happen? After 20 years of being married, all stars were being willing to ask and answer hard questions. I have a free downloadable PDF for you for a happy, successful, lasting love. Click the link below for free access to the most important questions you must ask your partner, PDF. I have a connection with this person. I, we have something special here and I know that we can make this work. Then that means you don't need to be there. That means you need to address the why. And in addressing the why, so if the why is, I'm afraid to be alone. Okay, now why are you afraid to be alone? Mm. Let's go deeper. You don't, don't stop there. Keep asking more whys. Why am I afraid to be alone? Where did this start? Where did this come from? All right? Now when we address that, here's the beautiful thing about healing. Because understand that the lack of healing and all the things I m- mentioned contribute to a lack of healing. Because even if you view it as, family pressure. Well, that pressure is hurting you. And if you're holding on to that hurt, and and for some, it might feel like shame, that can push you into being in a relationship that you shouldn't be in. Single shaming is very real. Absolutely. Absolutely. So once you're able, though, to heal and address and resolve those whys Mm -hmm. and release them, now you're left with, do I really like this person? Mm -hmm. Now it becomes so much clearer because if, if those motivations are now resolved and gone, Now you're like, wait a minute, I don't really care for this individual. It's kind of like how you'll have some women, and it kind of goes back to what you mentioned earlier about you're trying to be this person to make it work and only to look back and like, how did I get here? So you'll have a lot of women, and again, this can happen to men as well, where they play this role to get a man. 
All right, which is why I'm so against tips and tricks on how to get a man because, yeah, yeah you might get him, but then you wake up five, ten years later and you're like, who the hell is this man next to me? Why am I here? This is this is not me. This does not work for me. You were not walking in your truth the whole time. Mm, don't you know? ev- change yourself to please somebody else. Exactly. Yeah. And now another why that happens is I don't want to face the reality that I chose the wrong person. I don't want to face the reality that I lived this life and gave all this energy for nothing. Mm. And it's not really for nothing, but it feels like Mm. for nothing in that moment when you're faced with, do I leave? I did all this and built all this, even if it was on a fake representation of self, it's hard to now accept that, acknowledge that, and say, I have to walk away from it. Mm. So what happens is, rather than asking why uh, why we're here, we start trying to tell ourselves why we should stay. Mm. Well, you know the kids. Well, you know the family loves him. Well, you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to have to be single and dating again. I don't know what's out there. You know, all these things. You start to convince yourselves why you should stay rather than asking yourself, why are you here to begin with? God, that's so powerful. And everything we're saying really is understanding yourself. Because I yeah. think that's where the power comes, is understanding why maybe you've stayed asking yourself all those questions like if you say and i love that you're giving us very tactical things for us to then start to dig deep within ourselves so Mm -hmm. if you're the type of person that's right now in a relationship you're not sure maybe it's tumultuous you're not sure whether you should stay or go like even just saying okay why are you staying if your answer is because i love him or because the sex is great okay don't judge yourself like i'm all about us always giving ourselves the grace to just say this is and now how do i want to show up so if you're using those answers to now go a little deeper and say okay well the love thing okay if we can acknowledge this is a thing that's not allowing me to go deeper cool no judgment let me just write that down and now what do i what are those questions let me add to that because you can go deeper all right so your answer is you love him why why do you love him? Mm-hmm. I once asked a woman that question and everything she listed was what she did for him. Mm-hmm. So her, her belief of the love she had for him was really an attachment she had based on the investment she was making mm-hmm. into him and the hope that she would get a return on that investment. All right? So even if you say the sex is great, okay, why is it great? You should be able to tell me. Mm. Because again, it's very easy to use it as a superficial answer to kind of just say, okay, well, that's the reason why we don't need to go any further. No, no, no. Tell me more. Tell me more. Because a lot of times they can't. Mm. Now it's like they'll get stumped and be like, well, you know, I, it's just fun. No. Why? Are you actually getting your needs met? Are you actually satisfied? Is he actually pouring into you as well? Mm. Because here's the thing. If you say to me you love someone, Again, I believe that real love is a two-way thing. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm going to throw that out there real quick. Maybe I'm wrong with what I'm about to say. But to me, for you to be able to say you are in love with someone or love someone in a romantic sense, for a romantic relationship, and they do nothing for you, I think that's impossible. Mm. Because it's almost like there's nothing for you to love. Mm. You're attached. You're holding on to a fantasy in your head. Love requires that you're feeling something back and forth. There's something flowing between the two of you. That's how you're able to be like, okay, yes, I love them because of how I feel when I'm around them, their presence. And yes, the things that they're able to pour into me. And it's not just about what they do for me, but it's about who they are as a person. Mm -hmm. And so again, this person who does nothing for you, who, what about them are you so in love with? What about them are you so into? And there's a lot of women who right now could not answer that question, but they're still there because they're hoping that he can become what they've put in their own heads about Mm -hmm. him. But they're not facing the reality of who he is. Oh, God, that's so good. One of my friends, uh, Nadra Zabayan, she's a poet and she talks about heartbreak. And one of the things she very eloquently says is she basically was in love with the fact that she was the helper, that she was the one that was saving him. Mm -hmm. And because she'd already gone through heartbreak, she saw a guy who had gone through what she had gone through and she felt needed. And so what she had invested into the relationship And at the end, when she was asking herself the why, it was all about that she was saving him. And that made her feel good about herself. Mm -hmm. Because as, you know, a lot of women are very nurturing. We really do care about people. And so we fall in love with the feeling it gives us. Yes. That we are there for them. 
Yes. Not the fact that it is a reciprocation where I love them and they love me. Exactly. So again, you're you're attached to the feeling. You're not right. in love with the person. Uh -huh. You see? Mm -hmm. And so it, you have to ask yourself, okay, if they did not need me right now, if I could not pour into them in those ways right now, would I still want to be around them? Would I still enjoy their presence? Mm -hmm. Can I still talk to them? Can I lean on them in the times that I need to, someone to lean on? Even though we talked about, you know, how you have to show up for yourself. But yes, as partners, we do have to be able to show that we can be support mm -hmm. for each other. And if that man is none of those things, then again, you have to recognize the difference between what you're holding on to. And so many people are holding on to the fantasy, the feeling, but not the person, mm. you know? And that's why like when, when some relationships end, the woman is more devastated about the fact that her chance of getting married is gone. Her chance at having mm. kids has been set back. Her chance of now being able to have someone she can go to family dinners with is gone. She doesn't miss the person. Mm, she missed like what dream? it represented. Oh, and the she, dream that it could have, what yes, could have happened. Yes, what, mm. what it meant as far as all these situations that she would now have this man with her and, and what that represented for her and all these things. But it wasn't the man. Mm. He was just filling a space. He's, he's pretty much interchangeable. That's a bad sign. You should not be with someone who just feels so, like I can just remove them, put someone else in their mm. place. And I'm going to be just as good. Yeah. I don't think we realize we're doing it. I think it's very subcon uh, subconscious. Um, and I so that's why I really love what we're talking about. Because, again, I'm always the person that's like, oh, well, if we're naturally inclined to do X, Y, and Z, how do we recognize it? How do we change our behavior? Because, you know, if we know better, we hope to do better. Yeah. But if we don't know better, we may not even realize that these are the things that we're doing. Well, I, I think, I, I honestly feel like deep inside, a woman has some level of understanding, but again, there's the battle of what she wants it to be. There's also the battle of other people, what they're saying about the situation mm. and what they're convincing her should be normal. So again, let's say a woman's with a very toxic man. Let's say, I, I once had a situation where uh, there was a guy stalking this girl, stalking his girlfriend. And he parked outside of her house, watching her throughout the entire night, right? And... I was talking to the girl and her mother and the situation came up and the mother was like, what's wrong with that? That's what, if a man loves you, mm. he should be willing to do that. And so here was the mother normalizing this very toxic behavior. So it wasn't that the woman did not sense something's not right for this man to be acting like this. But when you have someone else telling you, no, that's not a problem. Or if, if let's say you got cheated on, or let's say you were even physically abused, but you come from a family that the lineage has had abusive relationships. And they're all going to say to you, oh, well, you know, that's how men get sometimes. Don't, don't worry about it. It's okay. Because if they didn't leave their situation, how are they going to push you to leave yours? And in order to feel okay about the fact that they accepted that situation, they have to make you accept yours. Mm -hmm. Because now if you leave, they have to ask themselves, why didn't I leave? Mm -hmm. And that's a hard pill to swallow. So I think that a lot of it is influence from other people who convince this woman that, no, nah, this is okay. As well as, again, she wants so badly for this to work that she ignores what she knows deep inside. Because I'll say this, every woman that I've sat down who is divorced and I ask them, did you know this was truly the man for you or not? And I even ask, like, did you pray and ask God about this man? 90% will say they never prayed and asked. 10% mm. will say they prayed, asked, they felt it was a no, and they married him anyway. Mm. So I've yet to meet the woman who says, I felt this was the man. I never saw any issue. I believe this was it. It was a match made in heaven. And yet here we are, mm. completely divorced and devastated. I I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I, I don't know. I am sure there is. But yes, but it's a rare occurrence. Mm. Most of the times, mm. most women can pinpoint. So again, I, I think that in most cases, there is a level of, I see what's happening here, but I don't want to look at it too long, so let me go look over here instead. Let me distract myself. And that's another thing that happens. So you start having kids, well, the kids become your distraction, or they become your buffer, I like to call it. So there are a lot of couples where the only reason they're able to stay together is because of work and kids. They don't have to deal with each other as much. So they don't have to deal with the reality that they don't fit together. You see? And now they can use kids and work as a way to validate why I'm still here. But they don't belong there. 
God, there's so much there that was so important, dude, that was so powerful. Um, the thing that really hit me was the belief part where we've been told, um, you know, because if you're told, oh, guys cheat, you do normalize it. Mm. And so even with everything we're talking about, like whether this relationship is the right one, whether you need to walk away or not, there are things that I think are very powerful for us to start asking questions, to almost challenge our own belief system because maybe we've normalized things and we don't realize we have. Yeah. Because I, I definitely am not blaming women. It's like, oh my God, women, you gotta sort your shit out. It's like, oh shit, you may have a certain mindset and a belief system that we even don't realize is exactly what is causing us to have these bad relationships. And yes. maybe it's time to walk away, but we're not walking away because we have a belief system that doesn't make us realize it, that is the yes. answer. And as you were talking, there were two things. When I was getting married to Tom, my grandfather, so my grandparents um, grew up in a tiny, tiny village in the mountains of Cyprus. Their mm. toilet was a hole in the floor. So I just <laughs> want to give you an example of how old school they are. Yeah. My grandmother only learned to read by reading the Bible because women didn't go to school or were taught to read. Mm. So just to kind of paint the picture. So I go to get married. My grandfather calls me into the bedroom the night before the wedding. It was like one of those scenes from The Godfather, <laughs> where he like, come in, sit down, he pats the bed. And he gives me this whole speech about, as being a good wife, it means that I need to obey my husband. Mm. That was the whole speech. Okay. Basically, if you're gonna get married as the good Greek wife, these are the rules, you need to obey your husband, that's gonna make your marriage amazing. So that was his piece of advice. My grandmother doesn't travel because she was scared to go on planes. So a year later, I go to Cyprus to see her. She meets Tom for the first time. Mm. She loves him, and then she pulls me aside. Her advice to me was, now look, if a man has to hit you because maybe you've been out of place, don't worry, it's fine, that's normal. Mm. She actually told me, now look, at this point, I'm law, I'm like translating to my husband and him going, do you know what she just said? Hell's no, right? So I'm joking about it because uh -huh. I realize that's utter ludicrous. But remember, I'm thinking it's utter ludicrous, but she's actually saying it with a dead straight face. Yeah, she's serious. She really freaking means that as a woman, as the wife, if the husband has to put you in his place or in your place by slapping you, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And so to your very point about these things may be normal to us because that's all we know, is super powerful. So what are those steps? Is it writing down what these types of um, behaviors are and if we feel they're normal? Like how do we start to break apart whether this relationship that we have is a, um, set on a belief system that is unhealthy mm -hmm. or that is something that maybe it's, oh, it just needs more communication and it can actually improve. And look, it's actually going to be worth it because there is light at the end of the tunnel. So I think the simplest way to break it down or to look at it is if whatever that action is or whatever that behavior is, is impacting you in a way that doesn't allow you to show up to the relationship 100% mm -hmm. in your true best self, it's unhealthy. So it doesn't matter how normal it is. So again, if let's say using physical abuse, if someone normalizes physical abuse, but that physical abuse now makes you more timid around your husband, feeling less safe, doesn't allow you to be as happy and as cheerful, it doesn't matter how normal it was from the families that you came from and what they passed down to you. It's unhealthy because you can't live in your truth. You can't live in your happiness. You can't live in your peace. You see what I'm saying? So even if, even let's talk about like, there's people who normalize a lack of a sex life in marriage. Mm. Having sex once a month, once every two months, right? And again, if you can honestly tell me that despite that, you two can show up 100% for each other and love each other and do all these things, fine. That means it works for you. But if you know that's causing resentment, anger, whatever the case may be, it's causing you to even want to look outside the marriage, then it's unhealthy. It doesn't matter how many people are doing. It doesn't matter how normal it is. or And really, the real word is how common it is. Mm. You see, I don't like to use the word normal because, again, that's how we kind of normalize yeah, it, you know? Yeah. So it's like, no, it's a common thing, but it's an unhealthy thing. So to me, anything that's at conflict with you and your spirit, we need to address it. And we should not accept it. So it doesn't, And it doesn't matter what it is. So even using the example of I'm thinking about like if a, a man is with, going back to the whole lifestyle thing, a man's with a woman that likes to spend money and she has him spending a ridiculous amount of money to where it has him feeling nervous, uneasy, mm. uncomfortable. This is unhealthy. 
it, it may seem like not a big deal to someone else, but if it's putting you in that position to now where you can't show up the way you need to show up, and let's be real, if you're not able to show up 100% in your relationship, trust and believe you're not showing 100% in other aspects of your life. That stuff lingers. So people can think, oh, I can be in this unhealthy relationship but be the greatest mom ever. No, you can't. Mm. No, you can't. You can be a great mom. I think it's possible to still be a great mom. But are you your best self? Are you really giving your kids what they deserve? No, because your cup is empty. You're drained. If you were getting your cup filled, it'd be a different story. So to, to be operating in, the, in that dynamic and still show up the way you need to show up, no. Even at work, if you're, if you're at, uh, resenting the fact that you don't get enough love at home, enough respect and support at home, when you get to work, you, your vibe initially is going to be down. You're not going to have the same focus. You're not going to be as excited about things because in the back of your head, you're thinking, I have to go back to this house where I'm neglected. And then you have these situations where people don't even want to go home. They want to fire. And, and this is, again, where you start hiding behind work, you, you know, taking on more tasks. I knew one person, a woman, who she was like in every single activity. All right. So she had work. She had after school activities with the kids. And then she had extra stuff on her own. And all of it boiled down to she was not happy at home. If you were happy at home, you want to clear your pay as much as possible so you can enjoy your partner. Mm. But you know it ain't no happiness there. So you're like, well, let me just stay outside of the house because I'm not prepared to leave them, but I know I can't get what I need from them either. Ooh. So does it start with really just writing down how certain things make you feel? Because again, if you don't realize it's actually not normal or not common, um, you may just think of it as fact. Yes. So I do think writing it down would be beautiful. I, I think writing things down is an amazing exercise. You know, it's part of what I use in the healing process. Mm. Even um, the very first step is creating what I call the who hurt me list, where you ask yourself who hurt me, and then everyone who comes to mind, you put them on the paper. Uh, doesn't matter if you think it's irrelevant or you think you, you're past it. Mm. If they come to mind, there's something significant there. And in a couple of senses of what they did to hurt you. And what that exercise does is allows you to put the hurt out in front of you. And you may be surprised who comes out because you've been suppressing stuff for so long. Mm -hmm. But when you ask yourself that question and really allow yourself to dive deep within yourself, you start to uncover a lot of things. So going back to what we talk about understanding what is not healthy for us and doesn't work for us. Mm -hmm. Writing it down is great because now you're putting it out in front of you. See, what happens to a lot of people is in that moment, this didn't feel good. I didn't like it. But now I move to the next distraction to not actually process what just happened here. Mm. You see, so I never really deal with the fact that I'm not happy about this. And because I'm not dealing with it properly, I can't articulate it properly to mm. my partner. So it goes unaddressed because that's another issue that I would find, even though we're talking about like recognizing when you should leave and that point that you have to walk away, there's a lot of relationships that end and both parties don't really know what the issue actually was. Really? Yes, because it wasn't properly articulated. And again, the issue that they're arguing about is on the surface and they're not going beneath it. They're not understanding. And let me also say this, because a lot of women don't realize, and I say this with love, you have to be very clear and specific with men. We don't read between the lines very well, okay? Mm. So you may think we should be getting it, and we really don't because you have to say it for what it is. So here's another example where I had a client. Uh, he was going to go see his family with his fiance. They're out there, and I guess it's time to go to sleep and shower up. And the family laid out towels or whatever, but there was only enough for him. The girl flipped, the girlfriend or the fiance flips out on him, right? You know, you never consider me, you know, so on and so forth. And his response is, it's just a towel. Mm -hmm. And so when he came to me, I was mm -hmm. like, no, she wasn't mm -hmm. mad about the towel, man. <laughs> okay, listen to what she was trying to say to you. You don't consider her. She doesn't feel like she's, you know, a priority in your life. That's the real issue. The, the, the towel situation was just the example at that moment. But for a lot of men... Even though she may have said it, because the main focal point was, why weren't there any towels out here? He's thinking, oh, she's just mad because there's no towels. Let me just make sure next time she has her towels. No, problem's not solved. So you have these couples that end up in divorce or break up, and both parties may not have understood. So the man tends to not understand 
because again, his struggle, his struggle with reading between the lines and her not being as concise and clear about what the issue is. The woman tends to not always understand because the man never even said anything. Mm -hmm. He didn't, because he may have felt like there's no point in telling her, she's not gonna listen. So he kind of shut down on her and he didn't fully express what she needed to know. Or, or he tried it once and she didn't receive it well and he stopped after that. Mm. So he may have said it at least one time, but he didn't make an effort to really break down and help her understand why I feel like this. Or, and, and going back to another example of when it's time to go, sometimes you have tried and you've expressed everything and you've been clear, but they refuse to get it because they don't want to get it. Mm. They don't want to accept your way of doing things. They don't want to accept what you need. And that just means you guys don't belong together and it's time to walk away. Yeah. So true. I love the towel thing, by the way, because as you were saying, <laughs> I was like, but also there is the other side to it where let's say as the female, you feel like you're getting neglected. They're just not paying attention, right? They're mm -hmm. not being kind. Maybe they're not thinking about you. And, you know, I think a partnership really you should be thinking about each other. And so let's say they've let it go because it's not a big deal. It's just a towel. It's just this. It's just that. And then let's say you've done it five or six times. And I know I'm just going to put my hand up and say, I've done this to poor Tom, <laughs> where I've let things go because I've realized it's just a bloody towel, Lisa. It doesn't yeah. mean he doesn't care about you. And so you let it go, you let it go, you let it go. And then the 10th time, you're like, I can't believe you didn't put a towel out for me. <laughs> now, in that moment, as I'm telling him, hey, I'm upset about the towel, it's hard for me to articulate is because I don't feel thought of because his response may be, it's just a fucking towel. Yeah. So now I feel like he's not going to get it because if I just say it's because of the towel, he won't understand. Now, if I go, because you didn't put a towel out, let me express to you why I don't feel thought of. And now it's, it's like I've got this laundry list of things and he may say, wow, you all that emotion around the towel. So now part of your issue is being diminished tom never did this yeah but it can be diminished by the other person because all they're hearing they can't understand you so all they're hearing is it's the towel and now you feel bad that you've spoken out and maybe got teary over something that's a towel even though we know it's not yeah so one this is why we have to create space to communicate our feelings when they happen or as soon as possible. We can't let oh, things yeah. linger mm -hmm. and kick the can down the road. So it's one thing to say, I'm gonna let it go because it's only a towel, if you generally are no longer bothered by it. But to say, I'm gonna let it go, it's only a towel, and I don't, because what you're really saying is, I don't wanna deal with having to deal with his mm. reaction to me saying something. That's a problem. So you're running from this unwanted potential outcome because we don't even know how he's gonna handle it. You've convinced yourself he's gonna handle it this way, and now, it builds up, it builds up, it builds up. I also think that, again, when that woman is going through that experience, she has to understand it's not about the towel. And it's not just about you feeling neglected in that moment. The reality is that you've been feeling like this. Mm -hmm. The reality is that he showed you this in other ways, but because you were either afraid to address it before or did not know how you wanted to say it or whatever, you kept suppressing and suppressing and suppressing. So yes, now that the towel is the trigger to now everything coming out, and let's be honest, in that moment, like it's like emotionally dumping on someone, and that's hard to take mm -hmm. all of that. And I think that for some men, to stay on it being a towel is a defense mechanism. Because like, okay, this is way too much to deal with right now. I'm just going to be like, yo, you tripping about a towel, right? Because <laughs> the minute so I, right. you know, if I acknowledge all this other stuff, this is a whole new discussion. I'm not trying to go down that route. So we're going to keep, I'm going to keep it on the towel while you're trying to bring it to something else. And we have this conflict. But I think that also, again, speaks to how we're communicating throughout mm. the relationship consistently about what is and isn't working mm. for us. That's why I'm a huge believer in like a relationship checkup. So part of creating a structure of communication, I believe there should be like a set day. Maybe it's once a month, once every few months, maybe six months, maybe once a year, whatever works for people. But this is an agreed upon time that we make time to sit down and we go over what's working, what's not. What I need to see improve on both mm. sides, we get everything out, excuse me. And that way, because we have an agreed upon structure it's so much easier to come to the table and one, be prepared to talk and be prepared to listen because we already know this is coming, mm -hmm. all right? And I think the earlier we can establish that, the better 
Because the, that's the thing. The, the bad thing that happens to so many people is that the issues linger and they start to pile up. Right. And now it becomes so much harder to, in that moment, address everything that stems from feeling neglected rather than just that one moment. Mm. But had we been addressing them one by one as they went along, then when this moment happens, we would only be focused on the moment. Mm. And that will be so much easier to get through. Because here's the other problem that happens. So, okay, let's keep using the towel. You're mad about the towel. You're mad about feeling neglected. To him, the simple solution should be, okay, I'm sorry. Next time I'll put a towel out there for you, I understand, you know, I forgot it. But you can't accept it at that moment. You know why? Because he's been doing this over and over and over again. So you don't believe his sorry. You don't believe it's going to finally change because he kept this pattern up for so long. And that's why we have to address it sooner so it doesn't become a pattern. And to his defense, he didn't know. He may not have been aware this was an issue this entire time. And again, this goes back to a lot of women feeling like, but he should know. How does he not know better? He's a grown man. But a lot of men are clueless to how that woman, specifically in his life, is feeling about certain actions. And unless you tell him, he just doesn't know any better. Oh, God, it's so true. But I used to think that was kind of BS. I was like, that's just their excuse. I was like, come on, you know, you know. Like, when I say this, you get it. Until one time where I was hinting to my husband about a Christmas gift. And it was just like a Christmas gift. But I was hinting because I was like, you don't say it out loud. You don't actually come out and say the truth. You kind of, you know, like hint around it. Uh So for about two months before Christmas, I was hinting, 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 hinting. This was one of our first Christmases together. So he was at his family's and I was at my family and he got me this box and I was like okay it feels like the right size I think he's <laughs> nailed it right and I'm feeling it and I'd been hinting to him the whole time I'd seen this watch at Guess it was like this beautiful little watch and I'd hinted to him I was like oh you know I love Guess and like oh my god that watch is really nice and Christmas is coming up right I think these are very obvious hints <laughs> so I get the box I go to open it and he goes I know I know I've got your hint I've got it nailed down so I open the box it's teak Teeth whitening strips. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry. I hinted at a watch. You thought I was hinting at teeth whitening strips for Christmas. <laughs> and he was so convinced he nailed it. And in that moment, I was like, oh, dear Lord. Like, yes. I just need to come out and tell him because he was so proud. He felt so much pride over the fact that he had listened, he'd paid attention, he thought he got it. And I was like, if we're that far off, from a gift where he thinks I would want teeth whitening strips for Christmas. Mm -hmm. What else do we think we're saying to each other, but we're not? Exactly. And I'm glad you brought that story because think about, there's so many times where men have tried so hard to make their partner happy, Mm -hmm. thinking they figured it out, only for her to be so disappointed and disgusted. So like, I don't know how you handled that moment. I laughed. But okay. (laughs) (laughs) How can you not? It was so funny. Well, listen, I'm glad you laughed because other people would have been in disgust. There's a lot of women who make that Mm. man feel like, like, it's if it's not what she wanted, Mm. it's like you did nothing. Mm. All right. And that can deflate a man that can make him feel like, what's the point of trying anymore? No matter how hard I try, it doesn't work. But the only reason why it's not working is because he does not understand what she's looking for. Mm. And she feels like he should know what she's looking for. And I always say, on one end, I feel like women aren't as good at dropping hints as they think they are. (laughs) All right? Clearly, I wasn't. (laughs) Let's face it. (laughs) And then on the other end, men are horrible at reading hints. Mm. All right? Same thing happens even in the dating process where you're trying to get a man's attention. And a lot of guys, they just don't catch it. Some, I, I, even me, I can be very oblivious. I can walk down the street and I'm not noticing anything. And, and if I'm with a friend, they're like, did you not see this woman staring at you trying to get you? <laughs> and I'm like, where? where? Right? <laughs> so in, in relationships mm. and in marriage and all these things, a lot of men, like, they'll say to me, if I just knew what she wanted, I would do it. Like some cases are men that are not willing to pour into their partner and they're just not the man for mm-hmm. her. Other cases are men who love their partner, love their woman, wants to make her happy, but he doesn't know what to do. And I think that that's where it comes to the intention because Tom really, like, leading up to it, he kept saying, I'm so proud I figured it out. Like, so, <laughs> so his intention was so beautiful. He really did try to figure mm-hmm. it out. 
And so when I saw the intention, I was like, well, what am I going to do? Like, if I'm now disgusted, it's like slapping him in the face. Yeah, like, that's, that's actually just a cruel thing to do. Yes. And because of that, he was actually so heartbroken because he was so excited that he thought he figured it out that afterwards he's like, please, for my own heart, like for the sake of my own heart, please just tell me because I want to make you happy. And I failed. And now I feel badly. And then, of course, I started to feel badly. I was like, well, I don't want you to feel badly. But it all came to the intention. I think that's why yes. I ended up laughing. And it, this was 20 years ago and the story still stuck with us. Yes. But look at that. Even, even with you just laughing at it, he was still disappointed because he didn't hit the mark the way he thought. Mm. And that's what I'm saying. Like, a man who loves a woman really wants to make her happy, takes joy mm. in it. E even if you don't hit the mark all the time, you want to feel like she genuinely appreciates this and, and this meant something to her. The, the thing with men is if they do something and they feel like it doesn't get a positive response, they will stop doing it. So it's like if a man started to bring flowers to his wife uh, every week and at some point he just felt like she's just very neutral about it. Okay, here's my flowers. Puts it to the side. That's it. There's going to come a point where he stops giving the flowers. Mm. But if she's always showing how much she loves it and appreciates it and, and she's pouring back into him, he's going to keep giving her those flowers, mm. you know, if he genuinely loves her. So I think this goes back to the differences between men and women. Women want men to be able to read the situation and understand it because that's what y'all do, mm. all right? You guys are evaluating mm. every little <laughs> detail. You notice this. But here's what's funny. <laughs> women, women will dig deeper into the details. They'll analyze a lot better than the man. But a lot of times, y'all might still get it wrong. Oh, yeah. All right? <laughs> and, 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 and you rely more on your analyzation rather than actually what he said. So, for example... You could ask a man, what do you want for your birthday? And he could say, just, you know, I just want to have a nice night with you at home. It's my favorite meal. That's it, right? And the woman thinks to herself, I'm going to throw him a surprise party. <laughs> <laughs> he's never had a surprise party yet. I know he's going to love that. Right? <laughs> okay? He told me he wanted this, but he doesn't really he mean it. Me. Oh my God. And then what happens is, so now it's in reverse. So you see how... Tom felt like he had it, yeah. but he was wrong. And, you know, he wanted to see that response from you that said he nailed it. Well, now, on the flip side, this woman decides to do what she thinks would be better rather than what he said. And then when he doesn't show excitement to it, she's pissed off. Because you've gone to all this work and Exactly. Effort. I did all of this. And you're not appreciating what I did. But to that man, it's like, I didn't ask for this. Hmm. I told you I wanted that thing over there. Like, men have no problem being very clear. So you don't have to interpret as much when it comes to what we want. And they'll flip it the other way. If the guy asks a woman and she's like, I just want a night at home. She gets home and it's just a night at home. It's like, where's the exactly. party? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I make fun, but yes. like, it, then... There is, and so this is why it's important. Like, I love this conversation because I'm all about, like, we just perceive things differently. Yeah. And if there's no right or wrong here, it's like, look, us women, we do do a certain way. And does it give you the results you're looking for? And that was the biggest key with me and Tom, where it was like, I felt like, well, if I have to tell him, then, you know, does he care? And I was like, well, hang on, am I getting the results I want? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. And he felt badly because he wasn't getting the results either. So I yes. was like, oh, this actually, in me trying to, quote unquote, test him, is actually making it worse. And that was the one thing he just said, please don't test me. Like, don't test me that I'm going to guess because I'm going to be bad at it. Yes. And so I'm always going to fail. And that's going to make you feel like you're not thought of, but it's not the case. Exactly. And so being able to have that transparent conversation is super important. And as you were talking about what we kind of say and like what we actually mean, I just learned actually say it. Like, babe, I want to party. I want to go to <laughs> Vegas. I want to do it. And now that's exactly how we communicate because I used to be the person that wanted the surprises. Mm. If you surprise me, it meant you love me. And I just realized I wasn't getting the results. So now we just changed our conversation to what do you actually want? And don't test the other person, just tell them. But I was the person, Stefan, that I thought the guys wanted the sexy lingerie, the candles. So literally one night <laughs> I'm surprising Tom and I've got, I bought this special lingerie and I put mm. candles everywhere and I put a blanket out and I put soft <laughs> music on and he walks in the door and then afterwards, he's just like, you know, 
you could just have floodlights and be naked <laughs> on the bed and like I'm very happy like the candles and the lingerie are for you and I was exactly. like what I was like this uncomfortable bloody lingerie isn't for me he's like I just want to get it off you <laughs> now look I understand not every guy's like that yeah. but in just realizing oh he doesn't actually care about all that and mm. now if I'm projecting what I think he wants yes. onto him actually it's not fair on him either exactly it's and also up- it makes my life easier as well not to have to now guess exactly and i think if you know even if you like surprises then you have to understand that you can't have an expectation on the surprise Ooh. you see so it's like okay i i understand that it can be anything i don't know what it will be i would just be happy that it was a surprise mm. it was spontaneous i didn't expect it and i'll appreciate that but in the moments where i know i want a specific thing Yes, it would be wise for a woman to just be straightforward about this is what I would like. Mm-hmm. This is what I would want. Make the man's life easier. And again, I think some women have this mentality of, well, if you tell him, you're making it easy for him. Like, it, again, it's not showing that he cares enough to find out. But him doing it shows that he cares. Yes, that's the effort. You know, th- there are tons of women right now who could tell their man exactly what they want and he won't do it. So mm. the fact that a man does, that's something to appreciate and mm. celebrate. So I think, the, you know, women have to just be more willing to be honest about it. But I will say this. I do encourage men to try to learn to get more in tune with their partner and try to get to a point where you can read her a little bit better. I don't think we'll ever be perfect with it because we're not you. You know, we mm. don't live in your bodies. But I do think that we can at least get to some better level of being in tune that will be very beneficial and that would make the woman happy. And I think both sides have to give each other some grace because mm-hmm. in the process of learning each other and, and understanding each other on a deeper level, it takes some time to, do, to develop that. I think the most important thing is that there's a willingness to learn and a willingness to accept and embrace how the other person mm. feels and sees things and how we can find that middle ground to make each other happy with it. That's why I love these conversations, Stefan, because that's the point of Let's just have the real talk. Let's just Mm -hmm. really talk about the stuff that how men think, how women think. And again, we're not being completely generic. There's going to be absolutely many circumstances that don't align with this. Yes. But I was that person, Stefan, that was like, but if he loves me, he'll nail it. He'll know the surprise. My expectations will be met. And it was only because time after time, I just realized I wasn't getting the results and Tom's heart was breaking each time Mm -hmm. that I then had to change the way that I saw things. So this isn't a like, oh my God, I can't believe men are like this and women are like this. It's like, okay, let's just talk about the reality. Ask yourself if this is now serving you. And if it's not, how do you and your partner adjust and pivot so that it does serve both of you? Yes, absolutely. And this is why I'm such a a big advocate of accepting the differences between Mm. men and women. Mm. Because once we understand and accept it, we can create that harmony that you're talking about and we can focus more on the results, as you mentioned. I think think people sometimes get too caught up in certain processes and how it should go. No, all that matters is that we get to a point that we're both happy and pouring into each other. And we're good. And, And I think, again, we just have to improve how we express ourselves to each other and and understand that how we receive it won't always be how we expect it to be. Mm. Because we're, we're constantly, I feel like, projecting onto others. Like another example I'll give you is um, I've been on some shows and I mentioned how I, I try to tell men, like I've noticed where if a uh, man's with in a relationship and let's say they're walking down the street and the woman says, I don't feel safe here. And to the man, when he logically assesses the area, there's nothing wrong. So to him, he'll dismiss what she's saying because it doesn't logically line up with what's in his head. Mm. And I try to encourage men, no, you have to understand you need to meet her where she's at emotionally right now. Understand that she's feeling this way for a reason. And, you know, some people would argue, well, you know, women can take advantage and manipulate you. All right, but if you know you're with a good woman, why assume the negative? Mm. You know what I'm saying? And it's the same thing with women being more honest and forthcoming with men. It's like if you're worried that he's going to use it against you, if he's been good to you otherwise, why assume that? Give him some benefit of the doubt. We're so, we're so quick to think someone's going to hurt us. And the reality is that in life, hurt is inevitable. People are human. We're going to all make mistakes sometimes and fall short. The key is, what's the intent behind it? Is there a willingness to learn and grow from it? 
are we going to acknowledge our mistakes so that now we can correct it and not have to have this continuously happen in the relationship? Mm -hmm. But going back to that example of the getting in tune with her emotionally, you know, again, because now once he dismisses her, she feels devalued and dismissed in that moment. Especially when it comes to safety. Exactly. And, and it could be in any kind of in different... I, I have a mm -hmm. few popping in my head, but... and and. That's where I think, again, if a man would just start to understand, she's not wired like you. You have to respect her wiring. You have to mm -hmm. expect the way that she's built. Mm -hmm. um, and once you do, and once you learn how to at least acknowledge, because a lot of times it's not even that you have to do what she said in that right. moment. You know, it's not that, oh, well, she doesn't feel safe. That means automatically let's just leave. It means acknowledge that feeling. And say, okay, is there anything like I can do right now to kind of help? What you need, or even reassuring her, don't worry, baby, I got you. If anything happens, I'm protecting you. That makes her feel more comfortable, and it doesn't make her feel dismissed in the moment. Mm -hmm. And now you guys find yourselves in more harmony. And now what also happens is the next time she feels some kind of way, she can be open about it because she knows you don't dismiss and devalue her in those moments. But if you shut her down, well, now, next time, she doesn't say anything. And now we're back to that towel example where it just keeps happening and happening. You keep saying, okay, well, maybe I'm tripping. Maybe it's okay. But you just feel in some kind of way because he keeps dismissing you. And then one day, outbursts, and now we have a huge mess on our hands. Mm -hmm. Like Being heard, I think, is one of the top things in a relationship, right? That if you don't yeah. have, it's like the sign of that your relationship is doomed. Absolutely. I absolutely believe that. Um, because again, we all, we all want to feel valued and respected by our partners. We want to feel like our feelings matter mm -hmm. to our partners. And I, and I do think that when someone loves you, your feelings do matter. And so I'm a firm believer if they're dismissing you constantly, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a sign of that either they are the wrong person or they are not emotionally healthy enough to be in a relationship with you right now. And, and you know what? I feel the need to mention that right now. When we talk about walking away and ending some of these relationships... I want people to understand that sometimes it doesn't mean this can't work out later. It just means it cannot work out under these circumstances. And sometimes people have to fall apart before they can come back together. So I think sometimes people are afraid because they think this is the ultimate end. If this is a person that you have a connection with, for example, or that you feel very deeply for, but right now, let's say there's a conflict because time and that time is causing... Uh, fights and arguments because you feel like you're not getting the quality time you need from them and you feel neglected, all right, it doesn't automatically mean this can't work with them. It just means right now it can't because they can't maybe get off of work the way that they need to. Maybe you have too many obligations right now. Maybe it's breaking apart, getting your situations in order, and then coming back together to make it happen. So where's the fine line then between that versus the couples, which this was my ex-boyfriend, we broke up like 30 times. It was like, <laughs> you know, turbulent argument, we're done. And, you know, then you go apart or you end up having this friction. Now I was much younger. So the communication piece, everything we're talking about, I wasn't equipped for any of this. Mm -hmm. um, but it definitely was, this isn't going to work, let's break up. And then it's the missing part, right? You miss them or you miss a feeling that you have. And then you either convince yourself, which I did, I convinced myself that, um, oh, maybe we can make it work. Now that I've had distance, I actually realize this is the one for me. And then you keep getting back with them because either you've convinced yourself or they've convinced you. Okay, so let's use the time, the not having enough time for each other example. You break up because you guys are always fighting about not having enough time for each other. During that breakup, you feel like you took time off. You feel like you're in a better place. You love this person. You want to get back with them. You miss them. You get back together. You're going to break up again. You know why? Why? You never address the issue of the time. Mm -hmm. That's it. At the end of the day, I, like there are some people who just believe you should never get back with an ex. I think that's nonsense. I think that you have to evaluate it on an individual basis. Different circumstances call for different measures. If the issue that led to the breakup has been addressed and corrected, okay, you can mm. give it another chance. If not, then it's pointless to try to try it again. Mm. And that's what most people do. Most people get back together without properly addressing and resolving what led to the breakup. Mm. So you're going to constantly be in the same pattern over and over again. And not only is it addressing it and correcting it, it's understanding it, meaning... If this man did something to hurt you 
and now he wants you back. He should be able to explain to you why that action was a problem. Oh. See, because if I, I can easily say, oh, I'm sorry, I won't do it again, you know, it, it won't happen, it won't happen. Okay, why shouldn't you do it again? What if he says, because I hurt you? Okay, why do you think it hurt me? Mm. It's like that earlier thing where we kept going with the mm -hmm. why. You got to keep going. Show me that you understand what the root issue is. So let's say he flirted with a woman. Well, I understand that flirting with women is inappropriate and we shouldn't be doing our relationship. I need to respect, you know, what we have mm. here. Okay, good. Right, right. But just saying, oh, I'm sorry, why? Because uh, it was wrong and you didn't like it. Okay, why? Why didn't I like it? Why do you think it was a problem? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's show me that you get it. Now when I see that you get it and you've corrected it, all right, we can give this another try. Yeah, I believe you have the three things of basically you should keep trying if he acknowledges it, mm -hmm. he understands and accepts it, and mm -hmm. then number three, he's consistent in the effort to try and fix it. Yes, absolutely. So talk to me about that last one. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confident workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. So here's what I feel the need to mention first. I think it's very important, especially when it comes to marriages and long-term relationships. So what I have found is Let's say the couple is a married couple. They've been fighting. Uh, let's say he hasn't been helping with the kids and he's been kind of emotionally neglecting her, right? So she's at her wit's end mm -hmm. and she feels like, you know what? He needs to show me that he's serious about fixing these things before I fully give myself to him. Mm -hmm. So now he's trying. And for the next two weeks, he's watching the kids. He's sitting down, talking. He's doing all these things. But because she has it in her head that I'm not ready to give myself because I don't trust your progress, she keeps holding back. He starts to feel like this ain't working. What's the point? Mm -hmm. And after two weeks, he reverts back to the same nonsense. Now, some people can make the argument, well, if he really changed, he wouldn't revert back to the same nonsense. That's a fair argument. However, if he's trying to put forth an effort in things that maybe weren't second nature to him Maybe he wasn't accustomed to doing, but he's trying to get into that mode. And he's not seeing anything that shows him this is actually working. He will stop. Mm. That's how men are wired. So when we talk about a man consistently putting forth the effort to correct, we have to understand there needs to be, I hate to say it like this, but kind of a reward system. All right. It's like, I hate to say it like this too. It's like training a dog. I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say you that. You got a little Scooby snack here and there. You got to do something. All right. So, and, and I'm not even saying, like, it's just about showing appreciation. It's about acknowledging the effort. I see you've been trying. Thank you. I appreciate that. That makes him feel like, okay, I'm being seen. This is working. I can keep doing this. All right. But if you just hold back on him, he's going to stop. I love this so much. And the reason why I love it, and I knew you were going to say train a dog, is me and Tom literally say this to each other. Because we're so open, we have this communication, mm -hmm. we literally say, I need your encouragement. Right now, you've asked me to do something which I've absolutely, I'm really keen to show up for you, to show you that I'm committed to this relationship. But I'm a human. And as humans, we need encouragement. Mm -hmm. And so it may take me three months to get there. But what I need from you is I need your encouragement that is, as I start to try that I'm going to mess up, I'm going to fall, I'm going yeah. to forget. But if you can keep encouraging, like almost give, tell him that, like, you know, give me that encouragement because that will help me get to where I need to go and vice versa. Mm -hmm. The same thing, I'll be like, babe, thank you so much for trying. You're not there yet. And what I would love differently is X, Y, and Z, but thank you so much for trying. And it's really just the trying part that goes, oh, cool. It's appreciated. Yes. And so even though it's like the joke of the training and the dog, it's actually real. And so we just... <laughs> go to what serves you and your relationship. And because we both realize, we both want this encouragement, that when we're trying to change our behavior, you need that to get to where you need to go. It's gonna take time and consistency. And let's face it, it takes at least 30 days to create a new habit. 
and I'm so like I literally was gonna say what I've suggested to couples is have a 30 day trial period. Mm. And in that 30 days, though, the key is both sides have to show up 100 yes. percent. It cannot be one person gets to sit back to see what the other person makes corrections. Even mm. if it was the other person who violated or did whatever mm. wrong, you have to both be at this together to really see if it'll work. Because now, if in 30 days, for example, that woman is doing her part and that man is trying, and in that time, he falls off again while she's still doing her part, this is the evidence that this isn't it. It's not going to work. Mm. He needs to go. Because he can't even keep it up when you're doing what you're supposed to do and you're and you know he's already been instructed, he's been given the guidance, mm. there's no excuse for him. Mm -hmm. But if you hold back... He can't keep it up forever like that. So I need 30 days, both of you being the best that you can be. Let's see what happens. Mm. And after that, we'll see if this can work or not. I, I've had some couples, you know, it reignited their relationship. Everything worked. I've had other couples realize this isn't going to work. And we fall apart. But it gave them the clarity that they needed. That's what I was going to say. That's really the key, right, is to be able to go, oh... This relationship is definitely worth the work. Look what happens when we both put time and energy into it. Or like, oh my God, we've both tried and thank God we now realize this isn't going to work. Exactly. Otherwise, we would have just spent the last five, ten years going down the wrong path. And I think that that's so much about what I've heard from people with COVID, where many relationships either realize, oh God, we basically were ignoring that this relationship mm -hmm. was broken and we should have left years ago. Or people were like, I needed this to reconnect with my partner. Yes. And, and that's, that goes back to the example of how people are just using distractions and buffers in their life mm. to tolerate their relationship. Mm -hmm. COVID had removed a mm. lot of those buffers and distractions. So it exposed a lot of things for a lot of people. Now, some people were still able to distract themselves. So I don't want everyone to think, just because you made it through COVID, that means you're with the right person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that's true. I okay. never thought about you that. Know what yeah. Some of you still need to walk away. But that's a whole other discussion. But... It definitely exposed a lot of things. And I think that's what we need to do is we need to have moments where we remove the distractions and really see what do we have here. Mm. Like one uh, one um, tactic, I guess you'll call it, that I've used or instructed people to do to kind of see if there's a real connection is go on a road trip for at least like six hours. No phones allowed, though. Like no, no talking on the phone and being distracted by the phone. Just sit there and see if you guys can talk to each other and enjoy each other. If we're starting off new or fresh early in the relationship and we can't have this moment, that's a problem. Mm. That's a real problem. Because you cannot find no relationship where two people say they have a connection that's been together for years and they don't have stories of once upon a time talking for hours and hours on end. All right? They all have that story. <laughs> so yeah. it's like a huge factor or a huge key to if you can't achieve that, we have a problem here. That's so interesting because that is definitely one of those barometers. Like Tom and I are always making sure, are we connected? Because I, relationships are hard work. And so we're very aware of that. We're always mm -hmm. trying to check in with each other. And the like, what are your barometers to be able to judge if it's a good relationship or not? And, you know, one of the things is, do we laugh together? Mm -hmm. That's like one of the things. If we're not laughing together, something's wrong. Either one of us is stressed, but to be able to come together, like that is very important to us. So we need to address if one of us isn't laughing when we're yeah. with each other. Um, and do we just conversate? So Tom and I, we go on vacation. We literally can sit there for nine hours and just talk. And people are like, what do you do? And we're like, we just talk. And they're like, about what? And you're like, to be honest, it, anything and everything. Yeah, it just... like, you don't even think about it. It's almost like, it's in on, I can't even believe how much we just talk, right? Me and you, we just, yeah. we're able, we've got this like chemistry where we're able to just really have this beautiful conversation. And I think that that becomes a natural thing. And if you don't have it with your partner, especially, right? A, you should have it with friends and family. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have it with your partner, that really is a sign. And with Tom and I, because we're business partners as well, I'm very um, conscious of, have we just been speaking about business for the last two hours? Because that's also the difference. Yeah. Is I don't want my relationship just to be out about business. So it's not even just assessing the time, but it's assessing the quality of conversation as yes, well. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, again, a lot of people overlook that and, and overlook the need for it. And, but it definitely is a great indicator that you have something real here. And, and I would argue that I believe that when it comes to romantic relationships, when p two people are able to talk like that, it's because there's this underlying desire to want to talk to mm. each other. So it's almost like 
we want to find something to talk about because we just like talking to mm-hmm. each other. So we might really be repeating the same stories over and over again. And we already had this discussion how many times. We don't care. Yeah. We're still enjoying it every single time because we have that draw to each other. Where as you have other individuals, it feel like they're forcing it. And they can't keep it going for too long. And again, they immediately need a distraction. Well, let me jump on my phone. Let me go watch the kids. Let me go do this. Let me go do that. Because they don't enjoy each other's presence. Okay, with everything we're talking about, the thing that I really want to make sure we touch on is as we're starting to assess, can this relationship work? Is it worth the effort? Do I need to leave? Like, is this becoming toxic? All these different discussions. There's um, one thing is we have been told or a lot of people believe that there's only the one that's Mm. out there for you. Now, I think that that could be a reason why some people hold on to relationships maybe longer than they should because they believe, but this is the one. And so if I can overcome X, Y, and Z, then it's going to work because they're the one. Mm -hmm. So A, what do you think about the one? Do you think there is? And then um, do you agree with me on the fact that it could be somewhat toxic to people? And when I say toxic, a reason why people stay longer than they should. Okay, so one, I want to say yes, as far as it can be a very toxic mindset. It has, it has caused a lot of problems. With that said, I actually still technically believe in it. <laughs> you believe in the yeah. one. So let me, let me break it down like this. Again, I'm a big believer in connection. And connection is not something that you experience with everybody. You can experience chemistry with tons of people. You can be technically compatible with a lot of people but you don't have a connection with everybody. When you survey people and you ask them, how many times have you experienced that connection in your life? The average person is going to say one time. If lucky, maybe twice. All right, And hopefully it only has to be one because hopefully they got with the one and that was mm-hmm. it. So I believe in that one person in that sense. And I'll, I'll use the word your best fit. I believe there's someone who is your best fit. Literally just one person. I know it's hard to say that there's just one person. I'm not going to say that it cannot be more than one person, but I think that in the course of your life and the way that things play out, mm. you're not going to meet that best fit a bunch of different times. Mm. All right? For various reasons. Mm. For one, you can, look, you can look at it simply as if you are in one relationship, right, And and let's say you get with your best fit and it doesn't work out for some reason, because that's a whole other story I'm going to get into in a second. Well, now it becomes so much harder to even embrace anyone else. The bar has been set higher. Mm. Your willingness to be patient through certain situations might be completely hindered now because it's like you you had steak. You don't want to go back to low grade meat, whatever you want to call Mm. it. Right. So. That can create a struggle for a lot of individuals. Also, again, I just think in the course of our lives, no matter how many millions of billions of people there are in this world, we're not crossing paths with all of them. All right. And I do think that there's many people you can have a relationship with. There's many people that you can have a level of success with. Mm. But I just don't think all those people fit like that best fit does. Now, the reason why I am a little hesitant when, when we use words like the one is simply because, like even using soulmate, they can be that quote-unquote best fit. That doesn't guarantee you're going to be with them. The unfortunate reality is that human nature, we have free will. So even though, if you look at it from a spiritual perspective, even if our spirits truly are aligned with each other, right? There's even this, this I don't know if it's a story or proverbs called the red string where it's like basically you're, you're, there's a red string tied from our heart to someone else's mm. heart. No matter where they are in the world, that string is always there. And eventually you come across and you see that the red string is right there connecting you two. And you never lose the red string, right? And I'm going to believe that you don't destroy or create connections. It's either there or it's not. Mm. But the unfortunate reality is that people still have free will. And for various reasons, people cho- choose to go in different directions. That's why I don't like even saying if it's meant to be. Because mm. to me... Saying that has a mindset of, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm going to receive this. I don't believe that. You have choices to make. You have to be wise with your choices. If not, you're going to derail where your life could have gone. Mm. All right? If I deviated from a one, I still wouldn't say more than two. Like, I I just don't (laughs) think it's this whole huge pool of people that you can really, really succeed with. 
and really live out your true purpose. And that's a, that's another big key of it. If you don't know yourself, then there's multiple people you can be with. Mm. All right? Mm. Because you're going to be busy trying to fit into different people's boxes. Once you know and identify yourself and stand strong and confidently in it, you start to realize that pool shrinks a lot more. It, it's hard for me to say that it really goes past the one. But again, I'll give it to. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason why I love this discussion is I really do get torn because I've been, obviously, like I said many times, been with my husband for a long time now, and I think to myself, what if I didn't come to America? Because mm -hmm. I met him, I came over here to study for two months, and he was at my school, my film school. What if I didn't come to the film school? Does that mean that I will never find the one for me? And I really have a hard time with knowing like, oh my God, this one decision will echo the rest of my life to either find somebody perfect for me or not find anyone perfect for me. So I think that's looking back in hindsight. Mm. It's easy to kind of break mm -hmm. it down and dissect it. Yes, we can say, well, what if you never came to America? But we could argue, maybe you were always meant to come to America. Maybe there was something in you pushing you in that direction that you're not fully aware of. That's why when I look at it from a spiritual perspective, I view it as, okay, God may not tell us, make us do things because he gives us free will, but he knows what we will do. Mm. So if he already knows the map of our life, he's already evaluated, let's just say, every person you're going to come across. So he knows which one is the best one. He knows which one fits. He knows which one that when you're aligned with will reach new heights and accomplish the purpose set on your life. The rest of them, yes, because it's free will, he will allow you to choose what you want to choose. But it's almost like a father. You came to your father and you had 10 guys and you said, which one should I marry? And your father might say, well, listen, they're all great guys. And I love you. So whichever one you truly want, I think I'm going to honor you. But this is the guy I like. It's not going to be... I like this one and this one. So just choose one of these two. <laughs> right? And if you're God, I don't need multiple options to give you. I'm God. Like, I know which one is the right one. So to me, I just feel like if, if, you, if you have a relationship with God and you're using that to guide you, he knows which one is that person who is the best fit. But again, people have choices in life. And some people don't choose their best fit. You know, and so that's why nothing is guaranteed as far as that is concerned. Mm. As you were saying that my dad didn't want me to marry Tom. So Tom went to him and asked for his blessing to marry mm. me. And my dad said no. Wow. But he said, thank you. I respect you. But I just want to let you know, I'm going to ask your daughter in a way. Thank um, God you didn't listen. <laughs> yeah, I know. And look, my dad was always very gracious. He never was like that guy that like stopped talking to me or anything. But he definitely was like, you guys come from different cultures, different countries, different backgrounds. And, and I'm, I'm not to cut you off, no, but I'm please. so glad you mentioned that. So I have this conflicting view on compatibility. Mm. So I've always said compatibility is like at the bottom end of it. So there's connection to me, the highest chemistry, and then compatibility. And my argument has been is because compatibility is a very logical breakdown of who should come together, mm. who would fit. So as your father said, well, two different backgrounds, two this, the, you know, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't, it's not compatible in his head. Mm -hmm. But the actual definition of compatibility is two people coexisting in harmony. Yes. So now I, I, I mentioned on, on Jay's show, like, okay, I'm changing my view on it because that compatibility we need. And even though on paper, you and Tom did not make sense, you two were still compatible mm. because your differences complement each other. Because again, I feel that underlying connection that's there is what makes everything else work. Oh my God, that's so good. Dude, that's so good. Because <laughs> you're right. People have bucketed compatibility as exactly that. Oh, you're both religious. You both come from this place. You both do this. Okay, mm. great. You're compatible. Yes. Because to your point, I was brought up Greek Orthodox. I was christened, go to church, I speak Greek. And Tom wasn't christened, doesn't speak another language, didn't believe in God. And so when we first met, to me, it was never a problem. Like I never was the person that I had to marry someone that believed the same thing as I did. Mm -hmm. And so when I met him, I was just fascinated of his beliefs. Like I love all different types of religions, beliefs, ways of thinking. And so I was like, wow, you don't believe in God? Like I think you're the first person I've ever met that doesn't believe in God, like mm -hmm. tell me about it. <laughs> and so I was fascinated. And so when we were talking about marriage after he proposed to me, a big thing was 
it's important to me that we get married in a Greek church. I dreamt since I was a little girl that I would walk down the Greek church, down that aisle. And he said, absolutely, I'll get christened. But I need you to know I'm getting christened for you. And so we can get married in the church, not because now I believe in God. And I was like, of course, I don't expect you to. And because we were so in harmony with respecting each other's ways of doing things, it never was a conflict between us. Mm -hmm. But I knew there's no way I could tell my dad that he didn't believe in God because I knew my dad, that was kind of like, that may have been like the breaking point for him. Um, But it was the compatibility that we were both accepting of how each other saw things instead of forcing each other to see things our way. Yeah, and and, and that's why, again, that's why I'm such a big believer. I keep saying that because I believe that like can trump everything. And, And I'll be honest, I'm... I'm the type that, like, if I was your friend at that time, I would have said, don't proceed. Mm. Simply because, like, I'm a big believer in if you, one's not a believer and one is, we're asking for trouble down mm-hmm. the road. Um, now, again, there's always exceptions to every rule. And I think I think you and Tom are just such an example of an exception to so many rules, okay? <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad, Stefan. <laughs> I think it's good. Because I, I think, again... But I'm misleading everybody. <laughs> well, I, and that's why I kind of mentioned it, because I want people yeah, to understand please. that, you know what? I love this. What you guys have at the core of it has allowed you to conquer a lot of these things that normally will destroy mm. a relationship. So I want people to understand that, though I still advise at trying to align with people who have the same beliefs as you, if you ever try to overlook that issue, you better be able to say that there's a connection like no other in this relationship. Otherwise, there's no way it's going to work. In most cases, that will bring it down at some point. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Unless that there's a shift in belief systems and the, the other to where now they're on the same page later on down in life. But everybody can't take that kind of a risk or whatever. Mm. But yeah, I, I want people to understand that because I do think that, again, when there's connection, I feel like differences don't conflict. They somehow mesh together. Mm. It's this weird thing. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know how to fully articulate it, but it, this is where opposites can truly attract is when there's a connection there. Mm. But when there's not, I just feel like, no, it starts to be, all these little things start to wreak havoc and just destroy everything. Yeah, and I think the two things that we also had was we had respect for each other, yeah. utter respect, and then the communication piece, because there was zero judgment on either side. He never judged me, oh my God, you believe in God. And I was like, oh my God, you're you're godless. Right? Yeah. Neither, like, <laughs> neither of us judged each other. And then the communication piece was, all right, if we're going to get married, what does our wedding look like? If we're going to have kids, what does bringing up our kids look like? And this was, we had this discussion before we got married, yeah. because I said it was very important to me that our kids got christened, that they went to Greek school, um, and that he'd never mocked or pushed down my belief system. Mm. And so we had all this, and he was like, I would never do that. Like, we will bring up our children. We chose not to have kids in the end, but it was, we will absolutely have them christened. We will absolutely teach them about the Greek Orthodox religion. And then as they get older, older, a part of what was important to him is then allowing them the space to choose as they got older and not forcing them to say, no, this is what we believe and this is what you must do. And so having that kind of happy communication, I was like, yeah, you know what? I don't need my kids to believe the same thing I do. I don't need my husband to believe the same thing I do. And then to your point though, over time, I ended up questioning my own beliefs. Mm. And then over time, I actually, um, now I am in a place where I don't believe in God. I believe in a higher spirit and I don't know what that is. Mm. And so I've kind of gone on this journey of exploration because to say, no, what we are or what we are and once we're dead, we're dead. Like, I think that's naive, but also I can't explain it yet. And so... I have evolved and pivoted, but I've also like researched Taoism. I've got friends that are Muslim. I've got friends that are Jewish. And so I think it's actually beautiful to be able to explore things. But again, I grew up in a certain way. But once I started to look at the way I was brought up, I realized I only did it because I was told to, not Mm. because it actually felt true. But I love the Greek Orthodox religion. I love the beauty of church and tradition. And um, those were all things also that Tom just respected. Mm. And that's the other thing kind of going back to the two keys that Tom and I had was the respect for each other and then the communication. Because if you respect each other and then communicate your opinion, if you disagree, now you can just part ways with utter respect instead of trying to push each other into a direction. Absolutely. All right, Stefan. 
I can just keep talking to you forever. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been told that we've got to wrap. Um, where can people find you? Where can people find all the amazing things that you're doing? Uh, uh, find me on YouTube, Stefan Speaks, and all social media, Stefan Speaks, as well as StefanSpeaks.com. Oh my God, guys, guys, I freaking adore this man. Everything he talks about is so fire. You gotta go check out all of his amazing content, all of his books, everything he's putting out is fire. Go check it out. <laughs> and I'd love to hear from you guys. Drop in the comments, what was the thing that really hit you in this interview? What were the things that really resonated with you? What are the takeaway things? Um, drop them in the comments right now. If you're not subscribed, click that subscribe button. And until next time, guys, be the hero of your own life. Peace. If you want to learn the four signs that tell you you are in an unhealthy relationship and it's time to leave, then keep watching. So excited to talk to you. Um, I heard something that you said and I was like, I must start the interview with this. So when we're talking about validation, feeling valued, um, I think of it as two parts. It's one, doing the work internally for ourselves and making sure that we have a foundation for ourselves to feel valued. And then secondly, that addressing the line in a relationship where it is their responsibility to show you that you're valued, um, but your self-esteem isn't relying on it. And I want to go to something that you said, that you said when you first started, um, when clients first started coming to you and you would ask them the first question is, what is your main strengths and what is it that you love about yourself? And your shocking answer, if you wouldn't mind sharing it with my audience, and then I really want to dive deep into it. Yeah, so I always ask my clients, what do you love about yourself? What are some of your strengths? And I've been so surprised because a lot of people really struggle to even come up with one thing that they love about themselves, one strength. And so that's something that I always work with my clients on is, is building themselves up and finding things that they love about themselves, knowing their strengths, because that helps them in their own life, but also in all of your relationships. If you know what you have to bring to the table and the value that you bring to a relationship, it's going to make that relationship that much better. Uh, yeah, I love that. So what is your advice then on those first steps for someone to really start looking at how they value themselves first um, before they even maybe even enter a relationship? Yeah, I mean, there, it's, there are always things that we can find to appreciate about ourselves. Um, it can be as simple as I love that I exist. <laughs> you know, it's so simple. It's so, so, so simple. I love that I exist. Um, I encourage people to write love letters to themselves, love letters to their bodies, um, practicing affirmations, and just affirming and validating yourself every single day. And sometimes we, the self-affirmations start with, I accept that, th that I'm struggling with this right now. I accept that I am where I am, and that's okay. And we work towards affirmations that are more of, I love myself. I love that um, I have the courage to show up here today. I have love that I have the courage to, to share my gifts with the world and, and to, to go about my day and, and experience connection with others. Okay, that's amazing. So now let's take it into you've done the work and now you're, you're entering a relationship. How do you... Um, marry the two, A, when, when I mean marry the two, making sure that your value system, how you see yourself, your self-esteem isn't fragile so that when you enter the relationship that it becomes, um, let's say, on um, on shaky ground or fragile when you're in a relationship that maybe someone isn't paying you the attention that you should deserve or that you need. I think, I think it's totally normal to, to seek validation from the people around us. We all want to be accepted, right? And sometimes we just need to be reassured that we're still connected to the people that we love. So when we're seeking validation, we're really seeking connection. And it can be incredibly healing to receive validation and be reminded of our goodness and value in a relationship. And val you know, validation is actually a communication skill that's really important. It helps people to feel heard and understood and appreciated, and it can calm fears and anxieties, and it can help to repair the relationship when there's been a rupture. And so validation is a skill that 
that I think everyone should learn how to validate each other. And it's okay to sometimes feel like you need validation from the people around you. The issue is that when, when we need validation from others to feel lovable and worthy, and when our self-worth is based on that external validation, it can become an issue because when that happens, we're essentially putting the other person on a pedestal and there's a power differential there. And so it's also an issue when we're, we're so eager for that validation that we allow others to dictate our feelings and how we behave and live our lives. So sometimes when we're seeking validation, we're just needing a little more safety and connection and reassurance in the relationship. And it's and that's okay. It's normal. We're all, we all kind of seek validation um, from others. And when we're seeking that external validation, we can be very externally focused on the relationship. And it can be helpful to look within and get clear about why we're seeking that, val that validation. What's going on at the core of it? And if it's, you know, some self-esteem issues, that's okay. Because there may be a really great opportunity there to learn something about yourself and to connect with yourself and to learn more about yourself and learn how to love yourself in that relationship. Um, so if that's something that is like recurring in relationships is struggling with self-esteem or needing a lot of validation from another person, it can, it just helps to validate yourself more. And because the more you love yourself and the more that you validate yourself, the more confident you are. I love Jordan, love, love, love that you say it's okay to seek validation in other people. You know, I'm always trying to grow and evolve and I'm always, every episode I ever do, I end with be the hero of your own life because I do believe that all of my strength needs to start with from within. But at the same time, I've been with my husband for 20 years and we've been married for 18. And it's like, I absolutely do turn to him for certain things. And it has been a process for me to, um, to really go through, you know, it's okay to lean on them. It's okay to look for certain things. Um, but it sometimes can be detrimental if you're giving everything over. And where is that fine line between being independent, being confident, being your own person and not relying on other people to give you your own self-esteem and at the same time, absolutely saying, yes, it's okay that you look to other people. And yes, we should be Ex um, expecting a certain amount of validation or value from our partner. So when saying it's okay to look for validation from somebody else, how do you do that and know you're not spilling into neediness and not having the own your own strength to do it yourself? Yeah. Well, and it's not a black or white thing, right? It's not, it isn't bad to seek validation. It's totally normal to want to be validated by others. And when our self-worth is tied to that validation, we have an issue because our self-esteem is then based on something that's external and out of our control. I hear all the time, like, don't seek external validation, validation outside of yourself. That's not a good thing, but it's normal. It's normal to, to need to be validated. And especially in relationships, it's um, a, a really important part of a healthy relationship. Um, and so, you know, in all relationships, there's a balance between me and you and us. There are three parts, right? Me, you, us. And healthy relationships have a balance between all of those parts. So if you're too dependent, you become enmeshed and there isn't much individuality and you begin to over-sacrifice your needs for theirs. Your boundaries get blurred. Maybe there's an over-reliance. You may not spend much time away from the relationship or have many friends or hobbies and all kinds of issues arise. And, and sometimes then our sense of identity is um, really, really tied to the relationship. It's just, there's a really big, big enmeshment there. But then on the other end of the spectrum, if you're too independent, you begin to lack connection and your relationship may become emotionally distant and lack, and lack intimacy. So then your sense of identity or self-worth or validation is maybe um, not tied at all to the relationship. And so I think there's a healthy, there's a healthy middle ground and all couples have to learn that balance between me and we and, and find that healthy balance. And that's what we call interdependence. There's a healthy individual and a healthy couple identity. And interdependence allows you to express love without sacrificing yourself. And in interdependent relationships, there is a lot of validation. There is a healthy couple identity, but you don't lose that sense of me in the relationship. And um, and that allows for good cooperation and communication and compromise, and you'll have healthy boundaries that are maintained that create emotional safety. So finding that interdependence, I think, is really key, and that's, 
that's that can be a really healthy balance but it really isn't black or white because it looks different for every couple oh i love that you say that like it's like i'm always looking for that one key insight and then ultimately i always know it's never black and white and it's never just one thing right so it's like the playing of the both um i've heard you talk about communication and when i heard you say this that i was like what you said it's um right now studies are showing that it's between 70 to 93 percent of our communication is non-verbal um i found that extremely fascinating because i'm always talking about verbal communication identifying words what words mean to you how words matter things like that and when you when you said that style i was like wow okay we i really want to go deep on the how do you do the non-verbal communication um and I heard you say a study, I believe it was the Gottman Institute study where they followed um, couples for six years. And can you um, tell my audience about that study and then the results and how that is a great indicator of how we should be um, behaving, if you will? Yeah, so like a lot of communication is nonverbal and oftentimes we overlook the nonverbal communication when we're talking about communication skills and how we communicate. And a huge, huge, huge thing is, is turning towards someone when we are communicating with them. How often when someone's trying to talk to you, are you looking away or looking at your phone? Um, are you not looking at them? And, and so that's just making eye contact, turning towards are really simple things that we can do to improve our nonverbal communication and really send um, signs of engagement and safety to the other person when they're communicating with us, showing them that we're curious and that we're interested. And so the Gottman Institute has done tons of research on couples and um, they follow couples you know, over six years, they'll follow couples, they'll check in five years after marriage, 10 years, and um, to really see, they're trying to figure out what works in relationships and what doesn't. And so um, in their research, they found that there are four types of communication that predict the end of a relationship. So the first type of communication that predicts the end of a relationship is criticism. And we all know what criticism sound like. It sounds like it's you never help with the cleaning. You're so forgetful or you never consider me. And you'll notice that criticism almost always starts with the word you. And I found that when one partner is trying to bring something up that they want to talk to their, the other person about, maybe it's something that they're wanting to change. Um, they do it by criticizing and you statements. And I see that all the time. And we can predict the way that a conversation will go 96% of the time based on the first three minutes of the conversation. The first three minutes determines how this conversation is going to go. So it's really important to learn how to start a conversation well. And how often do we do we try to bring something up with a criticism by criticizing someone? And so instead of starting a conversation with you, um, you statements like you didn't do this or you're this or or you know there are so many you statements <laughs> we, <say. laughs> we have a lot, <laughs> there are a lot. <laughs> yeah um, I give couples a formula to use that starts with I and the formula is I feel blank about blank I need blank so for example instead of criticizing and saying you never help with the dishes you can say I feel overwhelmed about the dishes. I need some help. And it's even better if you end with appreciation or a compliment because it helps your partner to feel appreciated and loved and they're more likely to help you out. And so then contempt is the second type of communication. And this is the single greatest predictor of divorce, according to the Gottman Institute's research. And contempt looks like mocking the other person, ridiculing them, calling them names and insulting them or uh, mimicking or using sarcasm or rolling your eyes. Those are all examples and signs of contempt. And it's really just a disregard for the other person that comes from a belief of moral superiority. So it's fueled by negative thoughts about the other person. And an example of contempt would be rolling your eyes and saying, I get it. You don't have to tell me a million times. Do you think I can't hear or something? Um, that's one that I've heard and that, whew, that one's that one's rough. And so the antidote to contempt is building a culture of appreciation and respect in your relationship by reminding yourself of the other person's positive qualities and why you love them and expressing appreciation and feeling gratitude for what they're doing right. It's looking for what they're doing right and assuming the best rather than assuming that they have bad intentions. And then doing small positive things for them every day to show that you love them. 
Man, contempt is such a strong topic. And I believe it becomes a stacking stone. It's not just that you wake up one day and then all of a sudden you have contempt for somebody. So what do you do or how do you prevent contempt? So you actually said, you know, saying nice things to someone like maybe on a daily basis or things like that. Like, that's great. But how do you prevent someone else from having contempt for you? You can't, right? We can't control others' behaviors. We can't control others' thoughts. We can we can set boundaries and and ask for respect in communication. Um, we can ask them, hey, can we retry this? Can you, you know, or say, I'm feeling I'm feeling attacked right now, or um, I'm feeling hurt by the way that you communicated that. Can we can we try again and and, and reconnect? And so there are ways you can't control whether or not they feel contempt or express contempt, but we can we can set boundaries and we can ask for respectful and kind communication. Wow, I really like that. So if you're sensing contempt in your partner, kind of stop, address it, say, hey, you've really, you know, express how you feel about that. I think that's super important. Um, and then highlight it. Because here's, I think, what a lot of people do, myself included, back before I had a growth mindset, um, I would ignore it, right? I would ignore the contempt. Or, and it would just start to build inside me, build inside me, build inside me, right? People start, get, he keeps giving me the dirty look, but it's like, oh, it must be in my imagination. And you end up ignoring it until one day it ends up becoming like the, the biggest fracture in your relationship. Yeah, yeah. And it usually does, it builds up slowly over time if we don't address it immediately it you know it kind of sits in the back of our minds and then it happens again and again and again and that's where we start building these protective walls that create distance mm -hmm. so then, um we you know naturally we're, we're wanting to protect ourselves if we're feeling attacked or if we're feeling like the other person is expressing contempt we might get defensive and that's the third one is defensiveness and that's really a way that we try to protect ourselves by reversing the blame and making it seem like it's the other person's fault and this almost always escalates conflict because when one person gets defensive usually the other person does too and so we combat defensiveness by taking responsibility for our actions and getting curious and trying to understand where is the other person coming from? What is their perspective? And can you set aside your own thoughts and feelings for a moment to try to understand where they're coming from? Can you feel empathy for how they're feeling? And can you take responsibility for your part in the conflict or in the situation and offer an apology if it's needed? Yeah, that's so true. Um, I'm curious on what the fourth one is. Yeah, the fourth one is stonewalling, which is shutting down and withdrawing because you're emotionally overwhelmed. And when stonewalling happens, your nervous system is flooded, which means that your heart rate is increased and you're in fight or flight or your sympathetic nervous system's activated, your, your body releases stress hormones, and now you've dropped down into a free state. And when you're in a free state, you'll usually stop responding um, you'll turn away, maybe you'll act busy or you'll tune the other person out and pretend like you can't hear them. And you're really just trying to avoid confrontation and you're shutting down in self-protection. And stonewalling is um, especially frustrating to the other person because usually they take this to mean that you don't care because it seems like you don't care. And so how we address stonewalling is we take a 20 minute break to self-soothe. And I say 20 minutes because research has found that it takes an average of 20 minutes for your body to calm down and for your nervous system to regulate when it's dysregulated so or when you're flooded. So take a break, plan a time to come back to the conversation and spend those 20 minutes practicing self-care or doing something that will help you to regulate and soothe your nervous system. And something that's interesting is that research has found that women tend to criticize more and men are more likely to stonewall. <laughs> That doesn't surprise me, to be honest. Um, you just mentioned flooding, but I've never really heard much about it. Can you talk to me a little about flooding? Yeah, so flooding is when we are, we have uh, our neuroception is always looking for cues of danger and cues of safety. And if we are getting some signs of danger, usually we are in conflict. Um, our neuroception is always asking is this, is this person safe? Can I trust them? Do they care about me? And if we start to feel like they don't care, or um, if we have any cues of danger, 
our nervous system will go into fight or flight and our sympathetic nervous system gets activated. And so typically then our heart rate will increase, um, blood pressure sometimes increases. We start to feel emotionally overwhelmed. We can, we can feel anxious. And so when we get flooded, we'll either fight or flight. And if we feel like neither of those are going to work, we'll shut down and we'll, we'll drop down into that freeze state that we talked about. And, um, and that's typically when stonewalling happens, but the key is to learn how to regulate your nervous system. If you notice that you're starting to get activated and flooded, um, to take a break, to self soothe, to regulate your nervous system, because if you're flooded, your prefrontal cortex, um, is, is essentially offline. We're not able to think clearly. We're not really able to fully listen to another person and understand where they're coming from because we're in that survival mode and all of our protective defenses are up. Uh, yeah, I love that, um, that breakdown. And then I've heard you say one way of just kind of eliminating it is just like give, a hu give, give your partner a hug. Yeah, yeah, give your partner a hug, um, make a repair attempt turning towards the other person to co-regulate a hug is a way to co-regulate so we can we can self-regulate which means we self-soothe um, breathing exercises are a really great way to self-regulate uh, progressive muscle relaxation um, there are a lot of different ways that you can regulate your own nervous system but we can also co-regulate or regulate our nervous systems with another person when we're flooded to help us calm down and so a hug is one way to do that um, taking a deep breath together, just pausing to repair and send some cues of safety and remind each other that you care in that moment, because that will help your body to feel more safe. And that will help your nervous system to relax a little bit more so you can shift back into that parasympathetic safe and social state yeah that's there's something the power of a hug and that's the one thing that bums me out about um covid is i'm such a hugger and i got so much pleasure out of hugging people that um it's sadly no longer something i can regularly do but there is something to a hug i i totally agree there um so the studies on the gottman institute you said that they followed couples six years after they were got married and the per people that ended in divorce um turned out they were only turning towards each other 33 three percent of the time and the couples that ended up in a successful happy marriage turn towards each other 86 percent of the time yeah like just turn towards yeah turning towards and so we make bids for connection um to our partners to to people um all the time whether it's just saying hey look at this or asking a question or anytime we're, we're talking to someone we're making an effort to connect with them and so they 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 observed couples and they noticed that that the couples that didn't last they didn't turn towards each other and the couples that did last when when one partner tried to get their attention, they turned towards them, they responded, they put down what they were doing, they looked up, looked at the other person and responded. And um, I've had to be, I've started to be very aware of that in my relationships. If someone is seeking my attention, am I making them the priority or am I making whatever else I'm doing the priority and, and where are our priorities here? And it's so, so important to respond and to turn towards each other when someone's seeking your attention yeah and i actually heard someone a long time ago actually um it was like a study and they said you can also tell how well someone's going to last based on how they tell the story of how they met so if you ask the couple like oh how did you guys meet based on if they say it in like a light-hearted way if they jump in in on these, oh no baby it happened like this or if one person's just saying the other person's staying silent and i was like that's actually really fascinating to see and so now i'm very conscious if anyone ever asks me i'm like i'm putting in like excitement and energy because um, I think it's really good to keep going back to your roots of where you as a couple first started and keep that energy alive. Yeah, I've noticed that in sessions when I ask couples about their relationship history, couples that are in happy relationships tend to remember and share their positive memories. And they also frame their difficulties or struggles in the relationship from a place of learning. They talk about how they've grown from their struggles and how they draw strength from them. And in couples who only share negative memories and have difficulty remembering the positive memories, that's when you know that negative negativity is starting to outweigh the positive in a relationship. And usually this 
escalation of negativity happens gradually and slowly and it happens over time and you start to express less interest in each other's lives you show less appreciation you compliment each other less and less and you'll slowly start to notice their flaws and start to entertain more and more negative thoughts about each other and without that open communication and repairs before you know it you're feeling a lot of resentment and frustration you'll feel like you've fallen out of love and lost the spark and um, you'll start this cycle of negativity and distance that really doesn't turn around without effort. So we have to retrain our minds by starting to focus on our partner's strength and positive traits. And we have to start making repairs by making efforts to connect and communicate openly and show appreciation and love for each other. It's really interesting. Um, we've been talking about some of the Gottman Institute's research, um, and they found that in stable, healthy relationships, the ratio of positivity to negativity during conflict is five to one. And then during normal interactions outside of conflict, it's closer to 20 to 1. So for every one negative interaction, there need to be 20 positive ones. And then in unstable relationships that are headed towards separation, that ratio is closer to 1 to 1. So Ooh. for every... Neg so yeah, that's one negative interaction for every positive interaction. And those are the couples that don't last. So this means that for every one negative interaction during conflict, you need at least five positive interactions to balance it out if you want to keep your relationship stable and healthy. And those five positive interactions are the repairs that we've been talking about, the, their efforts at reconnecting, their turning towards and just slowing down and, and, and showing that you care about each other. Girl, I'm so I'm so obsessed with stats, um, and that is so impactful. What would you then suggest? Because I like I love stats; it, it wakes me up. And then I go, well, now how do I use that stat to benefit my life? So when I think about people at home, it's like having a relationship for 20, 30, for the rest of your life is difficult. We change, we grow, we're always evolving. So to me, I put so much time and attention into my marriage, into my relationship. Um, and addressing the things that are wrong instead of putting blinders on. And so if people, and look, that's that's ver worked very well for me in my relationship. And so taking those stats, what would you suggest people do? Is it kind of stepping back and saying, all right, I've just heard this stat from Jordan. Do I stop and just assess myself for like a week and go, how many times am I criticizing my partner? How many compliments did I give them? And vice versa. And then go, oh, it's like two to one. And kind of like snap yourself awake. Like how do we actually then take that data and go, let's use this to benefit our relationship? Yeah, I think it's, it's the little things that you do every day that matter. And it's, it's the little stuff that adds up over time and can make a really big difference. And that's also the preventative work that you can do in relationships. So it's the everyday little things like complimenting your partner, expressing appreciation, reaching out to show affection and creating small rituals of connection throughout your day, like giving a hug and kiss every time you leave the house and when you come back home. And I'm not sure who first came up with this idea, but there's a metaphor that I love that is the emotional bank account. So every relationship has an emotional bank account and you can make deposits into this account every time you listen with your full attention, every time you keep your promises, when you show affection, when you make repairs, when you do something nice for the other person, when you make deposits by doing things that build support and love and trust in the relationship. And then you make withdrawals every time you criticize or break a promise or when you don't look up from your phone when your partner's talking to you, when you turn away, when you don't respond. And your account balance usually determines how you feel about the relationship. It indicates how well you communicate and how well you resolve conflict. And it's an indicator of the health of your relationship. So you want to make as many deposits as possible into your relationship's emotional bank account to pull from when you're going through a rough patch or when you're going through a hard time or when you're in conflict. And so it's just, it's the small things over time that really do add up and make a big difference. Do you also hold the account details of your partner? Because what I actually loved of what you said is you look at your own deposits, right? What are you putting into the relationship? What are you taking out of the relationship? That was so strong. And then it started to make me feel like, should we do that for our partners as well? Or is that like now a trap where people are like, look, see, I've written down you've only made like one deposit like is that a good strategy do you think a bad strategy yeah i don't think that that is really helpful because that can bring resentment but if you're noticing that you're needing um more deposits you're needing a more attention affection you're 
positivity from your partner, that's a really great conversation that you can have together. And um, that way you're both conscious and aware of how, how can we show each other more love? How can we be making more deposits? And mm -hmm. so framing that in more of a positive way, because I don't think the, the scorekeeping is, is helpful. I know, that's why I was like, it really is helpful for yourself, but it almost does the completely opposite when you do it for them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love it. Um, I also heard a quote from yours that's super interesting. You said, a lot of conflicts come from not feeling seen or heard. And when we don't feel seen or heard, we don't feel loved. Um, that was so strong because we're talking about a lot of elements here and what make up a successful relationship. Um, and it kind of comes, comes all the way back around to feeling valued, feeling validated, wanting to be seen, having every right to ask to be seen. Um, and then if that is the one thing that falls down, then you actually do not feel loved. Like that's so strong. So how do you um, ask to be seen? How do you ask to be heard? Well, and I'm not sure if you've ever heard of the, the five love languages by Gary Chapman. Um, but the whole premise of that is that we tend to give love in the way that we like to receive it. And sometimes um, we're needing to receive love in a little bit of a different way than it's being shown. And, and so just having a conversation with your partner about, hey, I'm needing to, to feel more appreciation and love from you. And, and, this is, and this is how I would really like to be loved. And it's okay to ask for that. And it's okay to, um, to, act, to ask, hey, can we, can we have some more conversations? Can we go on a walk every evening and just talk? Um, because I, I want to get to know you better. And I want you to get to know me better. And I want to stay curious about each other's inner worlds and what's going on with us. So where's the fine line between asking your partner to reciprocate all these things that you've said, hey, I want to go for a walk, you know, once a day. That's something that I actually really need to feel connected to, to feel seen, to be heard. And they turn around and they say, well, want that, that's way too much. You're being very needy. I can't give that to you. And then it becomes, I think, a struggle between how they see it and then how you see it. Yeah, well, and I think in, in a, you know, a healthy relationship, you care about each other, you care about each other's feelings and needs. So if one person is feeling like I, I need to be more connected to you, then it's just a really important conversation to have of, of this is what can we do to help you to feel more loved and safe and, and connected. And, um, and it's, it's, you know, I think a lot of times we feel guilty, like we shouldn't have to ask for that validation or appreciation or love or, or to have to ask to um, do activities that help us to feel more connected, but it's totally okay to ask. And it's so important to ask because otherwise we end up, like we talked about before, brushing things under the rug, we end up feeling disconnected and more distant. And so it's, it's, you know, if they're not wanting to do that, then, you know, we need to have a conversation about, you know, do we really care about each other? Are we really staying curious mm -hmm. about each other's inner worlds? And um, are we showing empathy for each other's needs? Because if not, then, then that's, that's an issue. There are so many little ruptures every day, whether it's just, you know, that moment of not turning towards each other that we talked about. And um, that's totally normal in relationships, but the the whole like what makes the biggest difference is um, is repairing how we repair those ruptures and do we turn towards each other and do we you know when we're feeling disconnected make that those efforts to reconnect and um, whether it's in conflict or outside of conflict that's so important. And is that a discussion that you would have with your partner and say, hey, do we are we committed to making the repairs of these ruptures? Yeah, and, and just having a conversation, like knowing what ruptures and repairs are, right? So it's like, what what is a rupture? It's a, you know, it's a moment of disconnection or an emotional wounding. And they can be really small. They can be really big. Big, big ruptures are more of like attachment injuries um, where there's been a huge break in trust. But the little ones could just be like not not maybe someone not showing empathy or um, not asking you how your day was when you expect them to, that could be a rupture. And um, so when ruptures happen over and over again without repair, you slowly disconnect and build those protective walls. And that's when you start to see more resentment and anger and, and apathy and doubt coming up in a relationship because if there's a lot of repeated ruptures and wounding, it damages the emotional bond and you don't feel safe anymore. And so like we talked about our 
our subconscious is always looking at, does the other person care? Are they there for me? Can I trust them? And, um, and so if we don't repair it, like it, it hurts the, the trust and the intimacy and it's kind of like a slow burn with more distance over time. And so, um, yeah, finding emotional like completion after conflict or negativity and hurts, um, the, if we don't, the resentment builds up. And so we kind of have to emotionally digest, you know, these issues together and create emotional safety and reconnect to move forward. So repairs are just, you know, it's a way to just shift the energy and reconnect and to show that you love each other. But well, I've got, a, I got a question for you, Jordan. Like, I'm still, let's just keep going, girl, because this is fascinating. Um, is it, is it ever too far gone? Is a, a um, rupture so bad that there is no repair you know it depends on if there's a a willingness to repair on both parts um i mean the biggest rupture maybe you could see be seen as infidelity that's one that is a huge rupture because there's a huge that's a you know i call that an attachment wound like rupture is you know there's a rupture but even when it's that deep it's an attachment wound and that's those are really really tough to get through and it is possible if both are willing to make the efforts to repair if both are if you know the person who um maybe was the one who did that behavior and ruptured the relationship um is willing to take responsibility and cares about the other person and cares to repair and if both are willing to repair it's possible but it takes a lot of effort and it's not, not easy to do. And so like we, we've talked about repairs, like the, the positivity turning towards each other every day, there are ways to repair, you know, every day with the little ruptures. And those are the deposits to the emotional bank account. And um, during conflict is the best time to make repairs. It's a way to shift the energy and reconnect and remember that you love each other and how you repair depends on the nature of the rupture, but just simple ways of repairing are showing your attention, expressing curiosity and affection, maybe reaching out to hold their hand and saying how much you appreciate them, doing something nice for them, making them food, saying I love you. There are lots of different ways to repair, and it's hard to do. It can be really hard to do in conflict when we're wanting to pull away, when we're feeling hurt, but those are the times when it's most important to repair. And so it, it looks different, whether it's during conflict or just the everyday repairs or deposits or um, after conflict it looks a little bit different but it's just bringing in more of that connection and care and positivity is what makes a big difference uh yeah i love that so much and my husband and i have a rule that like if we're in conflict um whoever can become emotionally sober first normally i'm the one that needs to walk away i need the 20 minutes like what you said i need to regroup myself and then i come back in the room and so usually if we're in conflict and i walk out the room whoever is able to emotionally get sober first we've made a pinky swear with each other that you walk into the room whoever's again whoever's in the mood first walk into the room and go baby and if you listen to this on podcast i put my arms up straight in the air and i smile and i scream it like with that voice even when we're mad at each other even when we're livid with each other we've made a deal that one of us must do it and it works like a charm because the second even if you're mad at them the second someone walks in and does that it's like wow he's willing to put it all aside and he's like he's happy he's got his arms up the tone of his voice is welcoming and it shifts the mood immediately now the only problem is sometimes you don't feel like responding right you're like no no no, i'm still hurt i'm still upset by you um and so once that happened and i did the baby and he was still pissed and i said I said, we made a deal. You know how hard it is for me to break out and for me to do the baby? We agreed you can never push back because it's hard to be the first person to do that. And we agreed that if someone does, the other person must reciprocate. And I said, you've just broken our deal. You must. And then, of course, I got mad. So then he was like, baby. I'm like, no, I'm mad. And it became like this, this like back and forth for three times. And then at the end, after like the third time, we're like, okay, this is ridiculous. We both are just, you know, trying to make it better. We're trying to heal. We're trying to, you know, repair this wound. And we're like, kind of like actually opening the wound more and more. So let's do it together. One, two, three. We did the baby and then we solved our problem. (laughs) I love that you found that. 
fun way to to make repairs. You're doing it naturally. And we do it naturally without realizing that we're doing it. But sometimes when we put language to it, it gives context. And then we can be more conscious to look out for, do we need a repair? Has there been a rupture? And how does that happen? And and you can plan. Like, like you, you've made that decision. Like, this is how we repair. This is how we show each other I'm trying to make a repair right now. And you can even just say, I'm trying to, I'm trying to reconnect. I'm trying to make things better. This is really hard for me, but I'm trying to show you that I, that I love you. Right. And some couples come up with like a code word, like giraffe or, you know, like a watermelon or just something silly. That's like an inside joke. And that humor can really help to, to break the ice and to, to bring you back together and remind each other. We love each other. This is why we're here together. It's totally normal to experience times of disconnection in our relationships. A lot of the people think that we shouldn't have conflict. We have these beliefs from childhood or just from society that we shouldn't have conflict that, um, and so we, so we avoid it or we feel like there's something wrong, but it's totally normal to experience conflict. There's totally, it's totally normal to experience times of disconnection in your relationship. And we usually go through cycles of connection and disconnection cycles of closeness and more distance. And that's pretty normal, but it does take work to reconnect when there's distance or if you're feeling disconnected, because we can't expect to see change in the relationship if we're not changing our thoughts and words and our actions and patterns of communicating and interacting and making efforts to show each other that we love that we love each other. That's fantastic. Um, there's something that I heard you say where I was like, oh, we've got to talk about this because again, it goes to like the nuance of the, the comment. So I've heard you actually say that um, there, are, there are certain fundamental needs that every single human need, that every human needs and there's two that I pulled out and it was actually an Instagram post that you did and there's two one was certainty and the other one was uncertainty and so I was like that is so amazing that they contradict each other and yet you need both and in a relationship I think we look for for certainty and the second there is uncertainty it makes us feel unnerved in the relationship so how do we take the fundamental needs as a human of the uncertainty of growing um, and yet use that as a strength in our relationship instead of pos- potentially a weakness. Yeah, and I, there's, there's, there is a balance, right? Because we want to feel a sense of safety and emotional security in a relationship. But at the same time, if there isn't any sort of uncertainty, and uncertainty can look like a lot of different things. It can look like um, surprises, like that we're going on a surprise date, you know, that that's, that's the fun sort of uncertainty that it's really healthy to have a good balance of that. And uncertainty in the sense that we also like recognizing we don't know everything about each other. I've been in a relationship with someone for eight years and we're still learning about each other every day. And so there's, there's that balance between the certainty and the uncertainty. And when there's a lot of uncertainty, especially in our external world, in our environment, especially this last year, year and a half, there's been a lot of uncertainty in the world. Um, Our relationships can help to buffer us from that when we create a sense of safety and certainty and um, in the relationship. But there's a balance, there's a balance to everything. If you actually want to learn what those red flags are, that he's totally wasting your time and it's time for you to get out of this relationship, click here. You don't trust that someone's never going to betray you. You just trust that you'll be able to handle it if they do, that you'll be able to walk away.